on a, a seed code product. And um, I'm not the first one in there. So the, the upgrade path is pretty much um, out the window by now. Um, but still, if, if I had been the first one involved in there, um, my thinking would have been, well, uh, whatever seed code releases something new, I'd, I'd want them to be able to upgrade with them and, and keep um, whatever I've done uh, bottled up in, into something um, that just bolts onto whatever C C code is um, is doing. So I, I would favor an approach where um, I'm, I'm doing my work in a different file. Um, and I think <clears throat> with, um, with card windows, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do that will make it look like it's part of the original file while it, it's really um, uh, not. It's, it's really living in a different file altogether. Um, so uh, those are the kind of considerations I, I, I tried to have. Um, and if we're not talking about a product, then it really depends on um, how, how is it uh, built and, and are there things that we're, we're OK changing the core files um, or if we would still want to, uh, to try and offset the, uh, the customization into, uh, into something else? How how would you deal with the vast amount of records? In I, I get the smaller sort of scenario uh, of of systems that are built where you you haven't got vast amount of records that are changing. Um, mm -hmm. This is the challenge that Penny and I always face: is the fact that in a night we could move fifty, hundred thousand records around between solutions quite easily, and it's that transition point of right. We've built this new module, and now need to talk that. Would you advise that you then? do a parallel write to both systems for a period of time and and see whether those are working and then eventually turn off the master one where you can if it's detached enough? I, I was mostly referring to uh, UI and processes. Um, yeah. I, I would not change the, um, the data store uh, because, like I said, if, if, if the manufacturer releases um, an update, you want to be able to to use something like the data migration to uh, to say, okay, we, they're going to migrate to whatever the, the manufacturer releases. Uh, the data is going to be into whatever um, seed code or or Geist or whatever folks uh, solution they're uh, they're using, and um, and keep that running. If if you start moving the data away from its original container, um, then it it's going to be very hard for them to to be able to apply updates it could be that you're free to do so and and because there is no manufacturer because it was um, built in-house or custom or, or or things like that um, yeah in as, which as case it's all in house as, as it's mm -hmm. a, a, like it's not a um, third party system or a vocal mm -hmm. platform it's none mm -hmm. of that it's literally all in house so so but let me return the question then what motivates moving the actual data from one file to another uh, for us, it's because of the legacy build. It's had so much um, code written on it that those systems have now been enhanced. So what you've got is the core code hasn't been cleaned up the way it should have been over the years because of the nature of business. It's that thing mm -hmm. of it needs refactoring. Some of these solutions were written in FileMaker 3. So Yes. So, so, you don't, so you don't need to make use of that code. You don't need to make use of the layouts. You don't need to make use of the scripting. You could you could still rely on on, on that for... Um, for the data storage, um, yeah, yeah, that's and, and and use it as as an external file, um, and and I guess um, if you, hmm, I'm not sure about yeah, data migration uh, would be would be difficult if the structures are uh, singularly different by then, which which I would assume they'd be. Um, so yeah, if, if you absolutely want to rid yourself of the, um, the old skeleton that, that, that you started with and, and, uh, move the data straight into your, uh, your other file, um, I, yeah, I'm not sure as to what I would turn to in terms of options, but yeah. if we think of it as like a, a data separation model, um, technically you could just dump the scripts, dump the layouts, and 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 just make that your data file. OK. 
some of the stuff is the cleaning up of them. We, we, we don't do data separate. We've never done data separation since since we've started for that that build. It's mm -hmm. not say we wouldn't, but it's it's something that's never been at the forefront of our, our build methods okay. at the moment. Okay. Um, but it's certainly something we could look at. Um, from from our our idea of trying to clean these up is, as I say, we've got some smaller systems that we've built over the last. Well, I say smaller systems; they still integrate with the, the core system, but they were built in the last five, ten years, and they've got modern architecture and they work very well. They're very efficient. They're fast. They're transactional. So we've gone down that route. It's just it's the, that big central core system that is is the challenge. I think I, I, I'm not sure how we would approach it. It's the point of is whether or not you would then have it as a um, if you've got as I say you've worked with clients before where the, you say well they've got this system that can't be turned off. It runs twenty four seven. It's integral to the business. It's it's that understanding how you guys would approach that that movement of data where you can have no downtime. And that's the problem we're facing is the fact that we can't find a window of opportunity to then get time to rewrite that. That's the mm -hmm. issue. Um, so, and it's trying to, I, the data migration tool absolutely is something that I know has come about that could actually help us because I've seen the, the movement of data you can get from one module to another and where FileMaker's going with that sort of technology. Mm -hmm. That could be something that could certainly help us in time. Um, yeah. So we, we had similar situations at press uh, legacy systems like coming from filemaker 3 old ones many hands on it some were good some were the the development coding was a bit of crap and yeah. we decided to migrate to different systems in one basically and the decision was okay we know we know what the business is doing right now right we know what uh, attributes we want all the tables everything so we rebuilt that from scratch we took what we want going forward and we want to keep what information we want to move forward, not uh, delete data. We created that model of data on a new separate system and we migrated the data after in a totally brand new system. But the migration was a bit scary at that moment because you had to send correct data to the new table. Now on your situation, you could get that model of uh, what you want to have as a new system to move your data, right? You create that, you just dump the whole data, import those data without having your downtime on your system and do uh, have a script getting the data from your current live system to your uh, new system. And when you reach a stage that almost everything is identical like everything it might be uh, in the middle of the night like 3 a.m on a sunday or on new year's day at that moment you just switch uh the source of your data so you're saying you keep it up to date for a period of time and then you you pick a convenient time to switch obviously if the amount of data we move we couldn't do that in one go it would be a long-term exactly. process where it, exactly. it, you'd run over a period of time get it in sync and then you're only moving transactional information from the last 24 hours then you Max. pick up your time I mean, that you switch you're talking about million of records right if you just move all of your data you have the new system just updating what is changing on your currently live system, right? You have that running. So when something is update, uh, updating, the new system will pick it up. And when you're in a stage that you say, okay, I know that on 3 a.m. on, uh, I don't know, New Year's Day, I'm not going to have so many transactions or my uh, period of data is like 100 or 1,000 records out of date. I'm switching that off and I'm dating those thousands of records to the new system. So you have a parallel system where the, the new system is getting the sync data. And when you yeah. switch, you move the old, uh, the data that haven't been uh, updated to your new system. But okay, so otherwise, I've got you to work need on New Year's Day or Christmas Day then. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine it's not a problem <laughs> even new year's day is a bit and dodgy I, I think christmas day is about yeah. the only day i've got so that's fine <laughs> and just out of curiosity i'm sorry yeah other uh in other ways you know how much data you move uh yeah. during the day right 
If yeah. you move all of the other data on your new system, I'm sure you can find that an hour in a day, not in a, a normal day, that you update less than a thousand or two thousand records. Potentially, you yeah. update. So you just switch that moment, the source, and you point to your new data file, and then <clears throat> you send all of the data that hasn't been updated to your new one. Okay. This is a challenge also, that we've got. We're, we're going to have to look at this. Just curious, if, because if yeah. if you do want to move the data, um, then how, how much of it is changing uh, day over day over day? Because my, my bet is that there would be a fair chance that a good deal of it is just not changing. Um, and we, and we move could... around fifty to a hundred thousand products of change a day, mm -hmm. and then we've got nine stores transactional sales relating to that. So agreed, there are certain modules. There are certain modules you're, that no, won't change hardly at all. And there's certain modules that would change regularly. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, but are you talking about new data or are you talking about records that end up being edited? Uh, that's new. That's new transactional that's, data. That's yeah. new. So I'm, I'm talking about the existing records. Once they exist, when is it they're getting updated? Uh, well, if we're talking about a dispatch level, we in one day we can move 30, 40,000 items. So mm -hmm. items of, of dispatch have been updated. So yes, it, yeah. it compounds, yes. You, you're probably talking a couple hundred thousand across products, items, and so forth that mm -hmm. we've moved. Mm -hmm. But a couple hundred thousand records is easy So I'm, I'm just saying it's if there's major, a way for you- It's not major, but you'd have to work it out, yeah. Yeah, if, if there's a way for you to isolate the ones that are, that are stale, that are not gonna be uh, targeted by updates, then I'd say move those. Because it doesn't change, like if you if you migrate them um, today and and or or three months from now, they're they're not gonna have change. But so those you can you can um, kind of um, scatter across time in, in your migration. Um, yeah. And and the stuff that is really like recent changes, re recent uh, record creation that you want to um, to encapsulate in. As as little time as possible to uh, to make uh, to make a move, but um, I I think I would I'm, I would still favor trying to not move the data. Uh, like you said, if if you're uh, if you have some some things where the setup is uh, is transactional, um, uh, transactional can can suit itself pretty well with uh, with um, data uh, data separation. Yeah. My my thing is, is I think it's, it's it's that painful job of going into a system that's legacy. It's got six hundred fields in it, and only half of them are being used. <laughs> and it's that mm -hmm. that thing of like, when do you turn that off? Do I delete that? What's the impact? Oh, this is connected to another twenty systems. So it's that side of it. So I think my approach is 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 going down the route of build a new file, manage the the data. I I think we probably I, I probably wouldn't be comfortable holding the data in it. Well, you could hold it in its current set, but to have some sort of triggers that could monitor whether a field has changed. If it hasn't changed in the last six months, that field can be deleted and mm. you can clean the file up. It, we know this is going to be a very long, protracted piece of development that we're going to have to go through because the amount of systems we've got. So, I think um, just interject on that. I think yeah, uh, we, we we've got we've got projects which aren't necessarily migrating. Fat large file maker systems like yourself but we've got customers who've got postgres sql systems um and it, it there isn't the i would almost i'd be thinking for, for us it, it'd be less thinking about the technical limitation of, or the time needed to migrate the data once you've finished it for us it would be the business continuity risk of of the, the reality is is you could spend three years trying to work out how integrated the systems are and still never find the, the end of that thread right yeah. so so the customers that we're working with that have got large, let's say huge Postgres systems that have got a, an app somewhere which is being used by five people somewhere in the world and they've got this connection and it's pulled into an FTP for this customer and it's doing this weird thing over here. And like what they need to be able to do is realize the benefit of our new system without having the risk of switching their old system off. And the only way that we've come up with doing that is, is I think what you're suggesting which is as soon as you put data in the new system, if that if that has a place, if that has a home in the old system, then post a copy to the old system as well and let the old system pick up that data and run whatever it needs to do. So you're basically keeping two systems in parallel because the business needs to unlock the value of the new development that we're doing 
but can't wait five years for us to do risk mitigation and rebuild the whole legacy system from the ground up. Yeah. Um, so we basically, you enter data into the new system. The new system has its lovely, clean coding conventions, database, all nice and easy. But when you hit save, it posts to the Postgres or SQL or, 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 um, or whatever database technology they're using. It posts the records there as well so they can pick up their processes from that perspective. Um, and that, that other, that other uh, development platform, whether it's Postgres or SQL, could be another file maker system. It doesn't matter what it is. That's the point. So. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the only, and then the only thing that you would then do is have, a, have almost an opposite trigger that we have. So when you load the record in the new system, you go and check whether or not it's been changed in the, in my scenario, in the, in the SQL database. So not right. when you save, you, you, you post. Because quite easily, in our example, they've got a huge finance department who will continue using the Postgres system. Well, actually, when you load a record to the to the sales team, we actually go and check that finance haven't changed it in their old Postgres system. So almost, right. it's very transactional, but that's the way that we build the system. But when you load a record, you check to see if it's changed, and when you save a record, it posts back. It posts both. It's a base. yeah. And, and okay. that's purely from a risk business continuity perspective. And risk mitigation, not a technical. There's not enough hours in the situation. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's where we're we're, lean, we're leaning towards like coming up with the best ideas. As I say, data migration tool can help you with that. Once you're starting that build, you can then start moving stuff between modules because you've got that that tool to help you, which is great. Um, but I think we're we're going down that route of going well. Let's break this into smaller modules do something similar to what all of you have said in effect like my is saying build it we've got data separation options we've got various other options we can pick whichever methodology we want to go down to write that new solution and then it's just move that data I, I think the biggest concern we have is that that point of as you said jordan is that that thing i can't i don't have the luxury to bring the business down for an hour let alone uh, a week and it's it's trying to find the areas of business that we can play. we do this on some of our solutions absolutely because they're not that critical so penny and i would work on it and we just go right that can drop for half a day because it's not that critical to the business we tell the business that's going to happen they're fine with that but it's those bigger actual systems our warehouse system we're, we're running a 24 7 warehouse so um i don't have the luxury to touch it it's it's, it's a challenge now that is modern so that's we only wrote that five years ago so that that is in a way that we can administer and we can maintain it. But again, it does talk to the legacy system, the core system. So it's that side of it that if we start messing with that, is it going to break this? So I think there is an element of all of what you've said uh, is, is valid. And I think we're just going to have to case by case pick whichever one is going to suit our need, really. Um, but this is the challenge Penny and I have got for the next <laughs> several years <laughs> so, um, of rewriting various bits of code. So. so Gary, I've done quite a few systems uh, where you have an existing legacy. And it, so the, the difference is about whether or not you're, you're needing to add new functionality, not just in terms of scripting, but data type of functionality, which is what I've had a lot of experience in doing, where one part of it changes completely how you would manage it versus you need to go back and look at the, the, the statement that goes, we've got 600 fields, you actually need to work out, first of all, how yep. many of those you actually need. Because Jordan's answer is correct, but not correct if you actually need to push back 600 fields every time as well, because actually the answer would be very different. But if all you need is 15, 20, 25% of them, that changes how that works. Yeah. Um, so, so in... If you're adding no new functionality, but just looking at better ways to script and interact with a subset of the same data, that will lead you to a different solution to actually what we need to be doing is recording more things, but that are differently integrated, different set of fields with some, you know, just in terms of what we need to record now. Because uh, I, I would go with the, and I have done several start with a brand new file so that that people just work in a new file and don't even ever know the other file exists yeah. um they they work in that in that file totally and then literally uh in a in a pure file maker thing i think the data api is a fantastic tool because that's transactional 
So you can just bundle up a bunch of stuff, send send one or more records at a time um, across. So, and but you also know whether that's worked or not. So it becomes transactional. You can deal with if it didn't work. Um, and then you're and then you all the people who like you say your finance department who are still working with their old stuff they can have that for another five years without you without them even knowing what's going on on the other side of the fence um but i think that's the better way to go is to just go I, 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 right, one of the right, systems we've got still. yeah one of the systems we've got is literally our, our online fulfillment and the reason we're looking at it is because it's becoming because the online uh, wonderful thing about covid is the fact that everyone's buying on the website which is a great situation to be in so um but the little system i wrote to deal with x amount of transaction has just been blown out of the water <laughs> so it's, really, it works it's fine um i mean vmware just for a lot more resources at it but it's there's a point where you can you're looking at it going that's not an efficient way of working we know that we can see it in the code it's it's not the right way of doing it we need to rewrite this bit. And that's the thing you look at it and you go, right, how would I approach that? And you, you may want to change one field. And that one field takes Penny and I several hours to track back where its dependencies are, what other files it's in. How can I change that? I can't change that live. It's other systems are running. I've got an hour here that I can change it and that's all. And I do a commit and it, it decides to do a field definition update that takes 35, 40 minutes. So because of how complex the system is. So the amount of records in it. That's the problem we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's what I want to alleviate. The smaller systems we've built, we do any of those changes, they're instantaneous because it's built in a more intelligent way, in a much more efficient way. And that that is the crux of the problem, really. Um, but I'll say I, 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 we've got various options. I think Penny and I are just going to have to go away, scratch your heads and work out which one's best. And I'll happily report back um, how we get on. So. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Thanks do, for the feedback. Much appreciated. Yeah. Do report back, Gary. We'd we'll be interested to hear how it's uh, how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I might I'm be sure. asking for for new work and new job because if I get it wrong, there won't be much of a company left. <laughs> 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 we'll see. We'll see where we go. So, thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, great. Thanks, Gary, for that, uh, and thanks everyone for your uh, contributions to it. Um, sounds like Gary's a happy boy at the moment, but comparatively. <laughs> uh next up i've got uh phil are you ready phil Hi. yes as ready as i can be you're, you're quite quiet uh sorry uh let's how on earth are you can everyone hear phil no you're extremely quiet phil okay let me see what i can do good old system preference Whilst Phil's fiddling about with that, I'm just going to mention that. Much, a bit better. Yeah. yeah. Can you cope with that? Yeah, that's yeah, good. That's good. All right then. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, My input just volume quick... had gone right down for some strange reason. <laughs> okay, okay, just just before you come on, just I wanted to mention I put the agenda in the chat. So if anyone's wondering about the agenda, it's in the chat. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Phil. You, Phil. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know whether I should be scared or not. <clears throat> um, been a long time since I've done this, so let's do the present. Allow that. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. yep. Pictures of cows. Definitely. <laughs> That's where I live. Um, this is this is me, and I thought you'd be interested to see. Um, where in the world I am. So if I just zoom out of here, you get the idea. I'm a long way away from you lot. Cool. Now I am, um, I currently work for a company uh, which is roughly based in Brighton. Um, but I'm doing this off my own back, not based on uh, the company I work for. For the past 19 years or so, I've been self employed. Um, doing my own stuff, uh, websites, file maker, consultancy, training, and all sorts of other tedious things. Um, but I was excited by the latest version of file maker, um, file maker 19, and the ability to run it on uh, Linux or, or CentOS 7. So I've been playing around with a number of options, 
and I've got two to show you. One is based on the Google Cloud platform, and the other is based on a straightforward CentOS server by a third-party hosting company. And I thought I could tell you the pros and cons of, of each, and some of the things that don't work on uh, Server 19 on CentOS. Please, everybody interrupt whenever they need to. <laughs> so, let's, uh, let's go to the Compute Engine, have a look at my VM instances. So, uh, has, any, anybody, uh, has, has anybody had experience with the Google Cloud? No. No? Wow. Or, or Microsoft Azure? No? Okay. So, <clears throat> Google Cloud, like just like with Amazon, you know, they're huge, they've got servers everywhere, and you can build your own virtual machines. So, let's do one for, uh, for FileMaker. And if this is not what you want to see, do let me know. So I'm going to do one. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll base it in London. Uh, general purpose will be fine. And I'm going to go for the uh, El Cheapo option with 8 gig of memory. And let's have a little look at the disk. And, and what I want here... Here we go. Just wait for it to update. I don't want all of those. No, that's not what I want. Operating system, CentOS. I don't want six, I want seven. 20 gig will do for this uh, demo. And then we've got to allow HTTP and HTTPS traffic. <clears throat> so that's how simple it is to spin up a new server. Okay, let's go ahead and create that. Now there's a number of things that happen straight away. Uh, you don't get a persistent ID. You've got a firewall with all sorts of restrictions. Um, and, and you get charged by the second, which is always entertaining. <laughs> so let's uh, let's go to... SSH. And I'll move that across to this window. Now, obviously, I've already done this, and I've got a client using it um, with one database and one individual accessing it. Uh, and what we've discovered that because of the per second building. Uh, billing, sorry. We're not even up to a month yet, and I'm up to 48 quid. Now, I don't know if people think that's a lot, or whether that's cheap. To me, that's a lot for one user, one database. Um, but if you've got a lot of users, or if you need the resilience that the Google Cloud Platform provides, then great. So we've got our server. And now we need to install uh, FileMaker server itself. And FileMaker will tell you all you've got to do is type in this. But let me show you where you get this from. You know you get the, um, the FileMaker download links, you, your license if you like. Um, and there's an option to, I should have had this, uh, I should have had this ready. There's an option to download FileMaker server 19, 17, 18 and all the rest. You know, there's an option that says you can download um, version 19 for Linux. Here it comes. Quick as you like, Claris. Okay. So here we've got the CentOS option. If you just right click and copy the link, that's what I'm using here in the terminal. So it's W, get, and then your link, and away you go. But. Straight away, with it being Linux, not every command that you need to use is available. So straight away, I'm doing searches on the internet and uh, thinking, why doesn't this command work? Well, that's because with Google, probably Amazon, you've got to install the command. So that's what you've got to do before you can even get FileMaker. Just takes a moment. Phil, how did you find that out? 
<laughs> Lots of research. <laughs> Searching, trial and error. Yeah, little thing I did is um, I installed a Zabbix server oh, from Zalion. Yep, yeah, I haven't um, tried that yet. That was on CentOS, and thankfully, uh, Wintercott basically gave me all these instructions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so I got that. So let's repeat that command. Away we go. And it'll start downloading. And on the Google system, it downloads relatively quickly. But I'm going to leave that going. Um, I was going to say, here's one I did earlier. The one I did earlier is only on 50%, which is uh, fine. I can show you something else in the meantime. So what happens is you're downloading FileMaker installer, but it's also downloading uh, a script that will install all the dependencies that it needs. So it installs loads and loads and loads of third-party stuff. Um, when we had the first trial version of this, uh, developer preview of this, you had to install all the dependencies yourself, but now it just does it all for you. And what's even better is it opens all the all the uh, ports for you, so we don't have to worry too much about firewalls um, opening up ports sixteen thousand and four four three and and all that sort of good stuff. Now I did think that Google would be a bit faster than this because it varies from time to time, but Google's going very slow. My other one's going a bit slower, so let's jump ahead to another server I've got uh, waiting in the wings. You can just bear with me while I get it sorted. And here. And here we go. So I'm going to do new while well, that's uh, doing its stuff. Let's do what should we have? Should we have red sands? That's probably not very readable. Let's have another homebrew. So here's another terminal window. Now, when I first installed FileMaker 19, I thought, I cannot do this with the command line. I need a GUI. Um, and for those that are interested, I've gone through the process of installing uh, a GUI called GNOME. And you would think, having a graphical interface, it would make moving files around and doing stuff really easy. Being a Mac user, that's what I'm used to. And uh, no, it didn't, because everything is protected. Unless you root, you cannot do anything. You can't create folders in the FileMaker data folder. You can't create folders in the secure area. You can't move files into it. So um, it forced me to go down the command line, which is really what I would recommend everybody do. <clears throat> Just take a little bit of time and learn some of the basic commands that are needed. For example, once FileMaker's installed, although it opens up all the ports for you, it's a very good, in good idea to install a firewall interface. You can modify all the firewall stuff yourself by editing IP tables and faffing about left, right, and center. But if you install this firewall LD, um, it makes the commands a lot easier to add ports, to open ports, to close ports. So that's something I would strongly recommend. To give you an idea, um, this is the command I would use if I needed to, to open a port 443. And you can just replace 443 with any other port you want. I needed to set up uh, FTP options to upload files today. So I just put in that command, port 21, away I go. Everybody happy so far? All quiet. I'm at one to myself. <laughs> Everyone's on mute. <laughs> <coughs> okay. So we go through all of this, we, we download FileMaker, we install it, we run the firewall uh, install commands, we've got the wget, um, that's all cool. Let me um, move on to my next jump ahead. Uh, we've got, if I go to bring this up, move on 
type them that right. Mm -hmm. So here we have the one, another one that I did earlier, where all I've done is <clears throat> spun up a server, installed wget, downloaded FileMaker, set up the firewall, and nothing else. Um, so let's just go to here. Now, one thing I'm, I'm going to have to show you when FileMaker properly installs, very often but, uh, Safari will not let you connect to your new FileMaker server. It will forever go, no, the server's not responding, I'm not doing it, I'm not going to play ball, it's not going to secure a certificate, go away. So that's why I've had to keep um, Firefox on hand. Firefox will always connect to the server. So keep an eye on that. You almost saw my motor racing, which I was watching earlier today. Okay, let's dump that. Now, does anybody know what the username and password is when you install FileMaker Server 19? What was that? What was that? Admin, no? admin. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It's really secure. Yeah. Oh, and of course, it's not admin, admin, because I've already set this one up, because this is one I did earlier. But um, let's go in for you. Oh, come on. Oh, that's because, here's the other thing to watch out for. When you install and set this all up, yeah, it's, it's admin, admin, and you think, right, I'll, I'll change the password, which I have. But to change the username, you've got to log in uh, using the terminal as a, um, a root user and use the command line. You can't do it in the admin panel. So you think I would go to administration <clears throat> and uh, change the username? No, you can try, but it doesn't let you. But you can change the password. So for ease, I've just been changing the password for now. Um, it isn't going to be that way forever. Is it not? Good. Um, one thing I do like, um, although I'm a great fan of Let's Encrypt, and I, um, I've got that on my various Mac FileMaker servers that I have set up. There's a script that renews the Let's Encrypt SSL. Um, I have no clue how to make this work on CentOS. No clue at all. But setting it up is a piece of cake because it doesn't require you to generate anything. All I've done is gone to um, the cheapest company I could find and bought um, a certificate. Yeah. And here we've got one, $15 for four years. <laughs> it's, it's quite mental. Um, so I buy that for whatever domain name I like, and I'm assuming everybody knows how to point the domain name, uh, or a subdomain rather, to a FileMaker server. Uh, you download the files that they give you, and you just import them. Job done. No generating CSRs, no passwords, nothing at all that's tedious, dead easy. So I, I definitely like that as an option. Okay. Uh, we're on seventy nine percent, so a little bit to go yet. Now, what have I discovered in using it? Well, I've got a client that um, generates a lot of PDFs from an iPad. They have drivers going out and about. They generate PDFs, invoices, and all sorts. And it wasn't working. I was getting blank sheets, blank outputs sometimes the odd square or shape and what we've discovered and FileMaker are now aware of this is that if you've got a layout in FileMaker and you generate a PDF from it and you say do all of that on the server and that means that the iPad users aren't waiting on their mobile connection for all of this to happen locally it all happens on the server in a split second if you've got any imported um, graphics whether they're placed on the layout or in a container field it will not work if you get rid of all imported graphics like logos for example 
and any imp any uh, container fields with graphics on them, then it works. But as soon as you put a graphic on the layout, you ghost. It will not generate PDFs. Um, and unfortunately, I've made the decision to move them to 19. So for now, until FileMaker fix the problem, which hopefully will be days, but we know it won't be, um, they're having to generate the PDFs externally. Okay. Uh, by the way, has anybody uh, sussed out how to hack in to the dashboard? No? Because one of the things I'm interested in doing is uh, just customizing it a little bit. So, for example, um, could we change it so the uh, login screen... Oh, I need a logout, don't I? <clears throat> the login screen has perhaps uh, my logo or somebody else's logo, maybe as well as FileMaker, uh, Claris FileMaker server logo, just to give it a little bit of personalization. Or maybe if this is the admin panel that Joe Blogs Limited, I would love to be able to customize the login screen so that it says, um, you know, this is uh, Joe Blogs Limited's uh, FileMaker server. Uh, I've been poking around in all the files, and I'm going to have to delve a lot deeper, but I'm hoping that one day uh, I'll be able to do that. Okay, so <clears throat> I've jumped around a hell of a lot, um, showing you some simple things. What have we got? What we're doing? Let's see what Google's doing. Google's only on 38%. Wow. Of course, the other problem here is we don't know how fast Claros are actually serving these files. Um, so, I'm sure Google can pull down files quicker than that, but uh, we have to wait for them to be served. Phil, do you want to um, do you want to pause there, and we'll let Gary go on to his next talk? Yeah, and that's then a good come idea. back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do, do we do that? Are you up for that, Gary? You muted, Gary. Uh, yeah, I can do that. That's not a problem. <laughs> That's a good time, because okay. mine's not going to be that long, so that's fine. Okay. okay. Great. We'll come back to you in a bit, Phil. In a bit, Phil. Thanks. Right. Uh, let me present. Hopefully, you see that screen. I'm not going to present it like this because if I do that, I can't see you guys. So, um, so I'm going to leave it like that because there's a bit of audience participation as we get further into this. So, okay. great. They say groans, <laughs> not that happy. <laughs> um, over the last few months, uh, Penny and I have been looking at various aspects of security within what we do, and we're looking at uh, various levels of how we secure data, why we secure it, and what we do. And I'm sure you guys, all of developers, already know most of this stuff that I'm going to go over. But I'm hoping that uh, uh, what we discuss now for, it's not going to take on 10, 15, 20 minutes, um, should hopefully provoke some thought uh, for you. Because I know I, I quizzed Jewel on this earlier, um, about a week ago, and it's like, hmm, OK, I need to go away and look at some stuff. <laughs> so, um, uh, so what I hope you get is, Understand a FileMaker helps secure systems. I don't know whether there's anyone here that's new. Um, if there's any newcomers to FileMaker who have not been around uh, for very long, uh, you'll get a guidance of uh, how FileMaker secures your data within what it does and the tools you have available to you. Uh, OK, PIP is new. Good, excellent. So hopefully, PIP will get something out of this. So uh, there's some key guidance that I'll go over just briefly to um, key things that we should do. Um, and then I've got this share and discuss idea, which is just to provoke some thought for you guys. Um, so let's start with how FileMaker helps um, with your security within what you do. Now, a lot of you are going to know that we have various levels of, of what FileMaker has in its arsenal to secure your data. Um, now these are listed, which I'm just going to whiz through. So we have file authentication and control. So we know that we can authentic, authenticate against the file with uh, file access. So you can then set usernames, passwords, and so forth. We also have um, access control methods with privilege sets and, and of like. B 
but you can also authenticate externally um, uh, OAuth, which I know is going to be discussed later on. And, and Claris also introduced Claris ID as well. So in some of these, you can you can build a very quick database very easily, as we all have, and we can authenticate against a set of names that we put in the database, and we're all good. We all know how to do that. There are the other areas of like the OAuth and authenticating with like Active Directory and those those sides of things give you a lot more flexibility in how you manage your passwords, your databases, and your access controls. So if you're working in a small company, there's probably no point because they're not going to have those systems in place. But if you're working with anyone that's like with Google and so forth, this is where you can then leverage a bit more power in what you do with your access controls. So certainly if you're working with a third party that then is a, oh yeah, we're a Google partner or we're Office 365 or whatever the flavor is that they're running their email platform from, you can then in put your system on top of that. So therefore you don't have to manage those access controls that's managed by the teams that are already managing their, their accesses through Google or AD or so forth. So that gives you a, a level of layer detachment for you to manage within your solutions. Obviously the access control privilege sets are key when you come down to those sort of levels of, of integration, because most of what you do, you are then getting the person who's dealing with AD or whoever it is to then update a central group and you make sure those groups marry up within what you do within FileMaker and you're good to go. Um, it's that simple to work on. But when it comes down to security levels, that's only part of the, the challenge of what we should be looking at as developers and delivering to our, our customers, our clients. Now, obviously I'm in house, but I've got to deliver it to my owners to make sure that we keep our system secure. So the next level is encryption. So, um, FileMaker gives you an awful lot of tools to help you secure your data. So outside the fact of people getting access to your data, whether it's the users, it's external, it's web, it doesn't really matter. It's then how you then secure that data that's held within those files. So uh, as Phil was going through, as part of what he's doing, he's sticking it in Google Cloud. He's then got an area where it's in VM. It's you've You've, you've entrusted that with Amazon, Google, whoever it is, and you're assuming that their security is it's good enough. Now, obviously, they open up certain ports for access. It's, it's that level of what happens if those ports or those areas get compromised in any way, shape, or form. Well, you may think, well, no one knows the password to my database. Well, that's fine. You would hope if you've got a strong password system in there, you should be okay. Um, I don't know whether you know, if you don't have an encrypted database, there are tools on the web that you can just chuck a FileMaker database at, it'll go off and process it, and a few hours, it'll come back with the admin password for you. So if you think your passwords are secure, think again, because unless it's encrypted, it probably isn't. So if you're then talking to your, your clients and your customers, and they're saying, how secure is the data that I've put in within this system that I've got, you need to be sure and consider that that information is actually secure. Now, pretty much the only way you can secure that file and not allow any intrusion behind that is to encrypt that database. Now, the good thing is FileMaker gives you that. They give you app encryption. So the actual application is fully encrypted end to end, providing you encrypt your data and then host it. You have the reassurance as a developer, you can say to your client, my data, your data within their solution I built for you is secure. To go one stage further than that is you can even, as we know, we can secure the data within a field. Uh, we now have these tools since FileMaker 16 came about that we have encrypt and decrypt within actual field level if you want it. So certain information should be considered sensitive within the solution. It would be prudent and sensible to start developing in that way, I'll admit. I said earlier, I've got some legacy systems. Trust me, there's some areas of our own systems that are not using these tools. <laughs> Hence the question of rewriting legacy systems. So that's where I am with some of the solutions that we're looking at. Obviously those field level uh, can be anything from text, numbers, content, or you can go up to container level, that's fine. And I put web technologies on that as on the end of that as well. And the reason for the web technologies being certainly in italics is the fact that most people don't realize that, well, I'm serving this out by WebDirect. Um, and as we were saying before, if you don't have an SSL certificate, you haven't got an encrypted connection to your web interface, you've just got a web browser on the end of that hitting your data and pulling your data. Who's to say that that is secure? Um, so 
do give it some thought about what technologies are going to access your file. If it's just FileMaker, you could probably argue the fact you know the ports that are being opened, you know the data's secure. If you encrypt it, you should be okay. So just my point is give it some thought. And then the other tools that FileMaker give you as well, which go on top of this, is obviously it gives you server logs. So which is pretty much the only thing FileMaker Server gives you, to be honest. It doesn't give you anything else. So you've just got a server log, and it will then tell you who's accessing what files and so forth if you ever read, download the event logs and read them. Um, there's a reasonable amount of information within those logs that tell you some information of what's being accessed within your solution. Now, the firewall area of stuff that I will highlight is the fact that, as, as Phil was sort of mentioning about opening ports and so forth, um, be careful about the amount of ports you open. Open them. The obvious things is the simple security um, check sheet. Only open the ports that you need. FileMaker will give you a wealth of ports, um, and it's around about thirty odd ports that they say is used. They are not. Um, in most instances, you can get away with about three or four for most solutions of builds. So it will go and open port sixteen thousand and one, sixteen thousand and two, and invariably you don't ever need them. Um, if, you're admin, if you're admin in the server directly on the actual host of where you're hosting it, yes, you need 16,001, but most of us don't do that. We're accessing it from somewhere else, so you only need 16,000. So bear that in mind when you're doing any deployment of any, certainly any server, that look at the tools and the things that are going to access it. Why open the JDBC, um, JDBC ports if you don't need them? Leave them closed. Um, so firewall is certainly something you should look at and certainly be at the forefront of how you set your server up. Um, I'm all for scripts to open in servers and there's nothing wrong with what Phil's saying is it opens those for you. But if you're not using those technologies and you're not going to turn them on in the admin, don't bother. Just leave them closed. It's, it's an area of security loophole that you don't need. Um, Obviously, SSL now, FileMaker don't allow you to run anything without an SSL. It does its own self-signed one. Um, I would certainly go down the route that if you're using any web technologies, yes, the SSL needs to be there. And the reason why I put it there is some people are saying, well, okay, yes, I only host off Claris Cloud or I host off some other solution. That's fine. But many of an instance before, I've, I've developed systems for people and I've given them and they go, oh, I've got the Mac Mini in the cupboard. Can you just stick it on that, please? And you're like, well, that's fine. Oh, yeah, by the way, it's connected directly to the router, so I want to use the web interface to let it out. Well, OK. If you start going down that route, you've got to just check to make sure that those communications between the outside source and also your inside source is secure. Because anyone could be sniffing on the packets that are going across the network. If it's SSL secure, you can't. Um, and I put Zabbix on there only because I've started using that uh, about six months ago, and it's totally changed the way I monitor my servers. Um, it really does give you an insight. Yes, it's a log. We get that. It's an event log. But if you download, if you've got a very busy server like we've got, trying to look at that event log when you're getting 10,000 lines going into it every couple of hours is is a lot of data to go through. Zabbix gives you an easy way, and it doesn't have to be Zabbix. It could be any, I use Zabbix, but it could be any monitoring tool that you could find that can read an event log. It doesn't have to be that brand. So if you've got fast view server logs or Splunk or anything like those sort of technologies, use what, all, I, all I'm saying is don't sit there looking through text files. I've, I've seen some solutions online where they've built a FileMaker solution to build the log file and read the log file. Fine, if that works for you and you know your way around it and it helps you analyze the log file, go with it. Um, but it's that that point of have something to analyze logs because that is the key point. It, it's the key area to the access points of your file. If you spot anything in there that's odd or an oddity, it gives you the first line of defense to then look at what's been hitting it and why it's being hit. Uh, if it's a, a malicious attack or it's anything that's then you go, well, I don't even know what that is, or you find out it's it's some user that just cannot remember their password and they're authenticating wrong every time, that's something where it's a training need or you can then talk to your clients or talk to your users and go, oh, are you having problems getting in the system? I know uh, John had a solution where he was pushing stuff back through Prowl and there was stuff where you were getting information back from server logs before the customer even knew there was a problem. So. It's, it's if you start analyzing your data, as far as that's concerned, certainly from a login point of view, it will help you with the security of your system. Um, just to go on with the encryption stuff is, and I hope you can see that it's a bit small, but just to give you some insight on where FileMaker has come in the last several years, um, 
Uh, the account password and the console password is a one-way hash. Now, in layman's terms, it is an algorithm of a, a code that is held on the server, and it's a one-way hash. It's it's not super secure, but it's it's the security level that's there. That's fine. Um, there's no real major problem with that. I think from a security level, that's OK. When you come down to actually encrypting your file, you're then at the database encryption is AES256, which is pretty good. It's not too bad. Um, I don't think that could be hacked by brute force in any way, shape, or form. It would take several years to do that. Um, there is now 512 encryption as well that's just come out and being used. I assume FileMaker will then adopt that in due course. Um, the crypt encrypt and crypt decrypt, which is the new functions to encrypt your data within your solutions, I've got a very good, robust solic uh, solution, which is very similar to what um, if you use a password manager like one password or you use LastPass or anything like that, they adopt the very similar methodologies to what they're using here. So it is very secure. That's fine. There's no real issues um, as far as that's concerned. Um, the other question, the only other one is the SSL, and it's using TLS 1.2. Um, and that TLS 1.2 is, is the industry standard at the moment. Um, uh, there is TLS 1.3 that's come out, which is even more secure. Um, it's algorithm and it's, it's, it's basically um, internal infrastructure is more secure. Just a word of warning about 1.2. At the moment, 1.1 was um, basically uh, deprecated this year. So if you're looking at the timeframes of these, I would imagine that probably 1.2 is going to get deprecated in about probably two or three years' time. So I would hope that FileMaker moves to 1.3. Bear in mind, it's been out for two years now. Now, I've we've been looking at some of our systems internally, and we've got some stuff that hits our websites using 1.2. And we, we're looking at areas of increasing our security. And one of the areas that they've advised is move to 1.3 as soon as you can, because it's a sensible thing to do. So we can't at the moment. We're at the mercy of FileMaker as far as that's concerned. But it's certainly something I think in due course in the next probably 12 to 18 months will get moved over to 1.3. Um, and then the secure storage of containers is uh, AES, which is uh, it's not as secure as the database encryption because it's, it's 128 instead of 256. But it's still a security aspect to it. And I would. Any of these is better than no encryption. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, they're not hackable. They're, they're very hard to hack. They're very hard to brute force. Um, and there are tools out there. The AES-128 isn't that great, but it's it's still better than nothing. Um, so it's something to bear in mind. Um, key guidance. The only things I wanted to highlight to make you aware of is the, the obvious things. Um, and I've tried to put these in order of uh, importance um, and to provoke some thought. Um, strong passwords, we all do it. We're all being told to use strong passwords. And how many of us have gone, oh, really? It's got 95 characters in it. It's got, it's got uppercase, it's got lowercase, it's got numbers. And how many of your customers have then gone, I can't remember this damn password. As far as I'm concerned, we're the developers. We need to set the rule. We have to be better at what we do. Um, I'm getting this challenge at work all the time. People don't want to use passwords. Try and educate your customers and all your clients to have stronger passwords because that is the first line of entry. And it's the first line that will get compromised. And, and that is, without a doubt, the first line of defense you need to be putting into your solutions and your systems. Um, if at all possible, which depends on how big your systems are and it depends on how complicated your systems are, encrypt everything. I can't stress this enough. Encrypt every single database you deploy. If you don't encrypt it, you're leaving yourself open. Because if that file gets obtained by anyone, as I said earlier, it doesn't take long to get access to the file. Um, backups is obvious, stating the obvious, obviously. Uh, make sure you've got backups. Um, the file we've already covered. The one area I think we don't do enough on, we certainly don't do enough, and we started to challenge this internally, is understanding the data that you use. So you go to a client and they say, yes, I want a CRM system. OK, that's fine. No worries. What do you want in there? Oh, name, address, email, so forth. Understand what data is going in your solutions. Because until you understand what is being put in the solution, you don't know how you need to secure it. So if you're just holding grid references from Google, who cares? They're in public domain. It doesn't matter. But if you're starting to hold social security numbers, national insurance numbers, you're holding financial records, bank details, medical records, anything to do that's personal then you need to consider how you're then storing that data. 
And that leads straight on to the FM crypt functions because that then gives you the power to say, we can hold that data within the solution we've got and we're going to encrypt it. So you give the reassurance back to your clients and your customers that that information that they're happy to pass on to you is then securely stored within your solution. Um, build the DR strategy. Uh, have an idea of how to make sure your solution will withstand the point of anything going wrong. Um, to the point of, I supply, I do my backups, but if we got a transactional database that is updating regularly and you haven't got an up-to-date backup, if you put that DR in, it means they lose a day's data. Is that enough information for people to lose? Uh, is that acceptable enough? Understand what you do. And whatever solution you come up with, test it. And I do mean test it. I don't mean theorize it, I mean test it. If it means go and delete the backups and restore and then corrupt the actual database, yes, take a copy of everything before you go ahead and gun ho and delete everything, but test it. Prove your methodology and your theory works because the day will come when you need to. And if you haven't tested it, it's going to come back and bite you. So don't assume that FileMaker will be there. Also, don't assume that FileMaker Cloud will be there or Amazon will be there. Uh, we had an instance with our publishing arm of our business where we upload and sell all our books on Amazon. You would have think, thought that Amazon would back all that up. We got an email from Amazon saying, oh, we just deleted three and a half thousand products. Can you resync them, please? We we're like, pardon? You're Amazon. How the hell can you delete our products? Yeah, it was an oversight on our side. Doesn't matter. We've got an API. You should be pushing through the API. Just push them again. And it's like, well, okay, if we haven't, and we did have a feed, so it wasn't a problem and it was linked, but you can't always assume those cloud solutions will be there. Absolutely use them. Put them in, if you're just doing stuff in the cloud and you're backing up to the cloud, back up to two different cloud solutions. Put one in Wasabi, one in Google, one in whatever, doesn't matter. Wasabi is really cheap, by the way, recommend it. Um, so if you don't know about it, it's Wasabi storage, awesome. So, and it's about a hundredth of the price of Amazon. Uh, so it, it's extremely good, extremely fast. So replicate your data in different places and make sure it's secure. Um, and that was primarily it, but all I wanted to do was, I hope that gives you an idea of where I've been thinking and what we've been thinking for our solutions. But part of this is I wanted, I can see 16, well, not 16 hands, because not everyone's got a camera on, but it's the pro. Have you ever del delivered a system where a client has hosted it? Right? And if you have, how were you sure that it was secure? And that's my point. You're saying, yes, fine, stick it on the box. Chances are it is a box that was someone's desk machine. They say, I don't know, I'll run the server on that, it'll be all right. You don't know what they're looking at, you don't know why, where they're going, what they're doing. Be sure that when you put that data on that server, it's secure, it's correct, and it, it, it's gonna be kept safe. Um, I would expect I've shoved hands across the board with this one. Do your systems have personal information in it? Oh, yeah, it's almost a guarantee. I'm sure everyone's a guarantee. The other thing as well is it needs to understand what personal information is. One of the things we were looking at about what we're doing is because we deal with contractors and contra not contracts, but contracts relating to film houses, um, lawyers, and so forth for, for what we do for the contract that we have. And this comes back to my point of understanding the data that's going in your system. I know if you knew, but name and address isn't personal information. Name and address is public information. It's not personal. So it doesn't actually matter from a legality point of view. It's name and address. You could go onto the electoral roll and get that from anybody. So it, it's pretty much there. Remember the days of the yellow pages? Some of us are old enough to know that. Um, you could probably go to the yellow pages and get business addresses and names and addresses off the internet and so forth. Telephone number is borderline. That could be deemed more personal. Um, email address actually isn't because most people on social media nowadays have a very quick search online. I could probably find John's details plastered in various places. Um, I, John laughs because I know he's, he's always there. Same with Jordan. There's certain people that throw their their voice on in the public. Well, you're in the fray there. But there's other people that are more private. So that's a borderline one. So do bear in mind what you've got. Obviously, when it gets down to gender, medical information, bank information, I don't have to state the obvious. That is not public information. If you're holding that, secure it, encrypt it, make sure it's safe. It's our duty to do that, not the people that are using your system. It's up to us to build it that way. Um, how many of you check server logs every week? 
well done, Clive. <laughs> um, it's really important. I've, I've gone over it earlier, but it is so important. You need to start checking that your data and your solution that you delivered is great. I'm not asking for you to do it. It's the point is you should be going into the, your clients and saying, oh, I'm putting this server in. Who's going to monitor it for to make sure it's okay? Who's going to tell me that Joe Bloggs is having problems logging in? Until you look at a server log, you're not going to know. They're just going to jam the keyboard until they get bored and they won't use the system. And so you're not going to know. And that, I'm saying the password issue is just one easy thing, but there's a lot of things in the log that can help you decipher how you need to build your system going forward. Also, from the point of looking at, from the server logs, you can look at the wait times, the remote calls, all that sort of logging that's in the server. If you start looking at that data, you can know how efficient your system is. So it helps. Um, how many of you have thought of a DR strategy in your organization or what you've done? Now, Clive does similar stuff to me, so I expect him to put his hand up. So a few of you have. So as I say, did you test it, Clive? I can say no. <laughs> so I hope the day never comes that you need to. That's my point. Um, so it's that thing. If it if it provokes nothing else from me talking about this, maybe Clive's going to go away and think, hmm, I'm going to talk to the company and say, I'm going to pull the plug out next week and see what happens. Uh, if you're that gun ho and your systems are that secure, do it. Really do pull the plug out. When we test, we, we build our own servers in-house. We've got our own infrastructure. We've got our own data center racks. Um, we when we put our racks in we do hard pull power if you go you've put redundant power supply in we'll bloody test it and that's the nerve wracking because we always give it to the little junior support guy go pull that plug out and he's like what <laughs> you sure I'm like yeah pull the plug out because if this goes down we need to know now when there's no data on it if it doesn't go down we're good now we can put data on it okay it's just doing those tests and making sure those things are are covered it gives you peace of mind to go sleep at night knowing that it's going to be there in the morning. And if it's not, you've got a way to get out of it. That's the most important thing. Right. So that's pretty much my speed talk on security and areas that we're focusing on. We're doing a lot of this at work, and I will do updates to this, and I'll do other things that I'll talk to Joel, and I'll, I'll give more feedback on. But I hope it gives you some provoked thought process. Um, and the only thing I want to add on is uh, I want to say congratulations to Jordan and Solus because they managed to get Cyber Essentials qualified, So, um, uh, which literally happened like two days ago, and I found out about it. So we're probably following the same circles as we usually do. But um, so congratulations for, for them for getting that. And But that is part of where you want to go. If you can get like Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials Plus, and move down to ISO accreditation for your security. If you guys are developers and you can be sure that you're doing that, that goes forward for your clients. Your clients can see that accreditation and it helps. So, and so that's that's me done. We can either shoot back. I can do questions after. I'm going to be around all night. So, um, so I'm quite happy to pass back to Phil now and let him continue. And hopefully, he's, hope your install's finished for Google. So, it, it has, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go with that, and we'll do questions afterwards. Absolutely, no problems at all. So, cool. Back to you, Phil. Cheers. Thanks. Hi. Um, I suppose I better turn on presentation mode. Yeah, that security chat was great. Um, I find that clients just do not want to pay for all the extra work that's involved in security. I can talk to them until I'm blue in the face, and they'll go, well, when we've got a budget, or I don't think it applies to us, or it doesn't matter. I I've got clients who store credit card details in the database, and they have interns who come in and work and access all of the files. And I say, this is not on. It's not how it should be. You should be restricting the information. You should only be showing the information that's relevant to the person that's accessing the database. The only way I would add to that is send them an email and get them to reply to say they exonerate you as a developer because they're cutting corners. Well, you need to cover yeah, yourself. Absolutely, yeah, I did that. Last year, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. it, it's it's bad, and as you say, when when other people look after the server, and you think, well, are they really looking after it? Um, you know, and and Farmac, it doesn't give you any warnings mm. if people haven't have tried to log in a hundred times. You don't get an email from the server, do you? Or at least not nope. that I've uh, come across yet. That's why you have to look at the logs. <laughs> That's right. Um, for one client, I did my own login, which. Um, 
verifies them against a, a, a it's it's a lot it's a login system that's got guest access so and all they can do is log in and they can only log in a certain try a certain number of times before they get blocked and if the user hasn't logged in for a month they're not allowed to log in and all sorts of clever things behind the scenes but it's still not great i would much rather get emails that go someone's trying to log in lots of times i've just installed um uh, it's gone out my tiny brain. Um, some software on my server that tells me about suspicious logins for the FileMaker server. I'm trying to find it. My screen's gone blank. Anyway, it's very interesting. And also, one of the things I'll mention is with this other third-party host I've come across, you can actually block access to the server um, on all ports except for the essential ones that FileMaker uses, 503 and 443. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah. Anyway, can you see my terminal windows? Yep. Yeah, good. So I'm sharing the right screen. Super. Right now, then, uh, let's go back to here. So, Google, it's installed. It, sorry, it's downloaded, not installed. Now we've got to install it. It's it's straightforward. We use uh, another yum command, yum install FileMaker. Um, I can help anybody with notes and things if they want it. Um, right, we need to be root, sorry. So let's just um, stick in um, super user at the beginning. See, here we go. Now I have checked Yes, that's fine. Just do it. I have checked, and FileMaker doesn't open all the ports when you do this installation. Um, it does seem, uh, on my little tests I've done while you were doing your talk, that it only installs uh, 16,000 and 400, uh, sorry, 443 and 80. Uh, holes in the firewall, port numbers, whichever way you want to put it. Um, now this installation, it really does just take a short length of time. I'm just going to let it go. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> and, and after this, I'm, I've discovered that I just need to put in a couple more commands and then the job's done. Now, I have also found out that you can um, uh, turn the server on and off with Google. So you can say, right, nobody's going to use this server from 6 o'clock uh, at night to maybe 9 o'clock in the morning. So you can, you, you can schedule uh, up times and down times, and that sh should save a bit of cash. And I have also discovered that when you do run the shutdown command, FileMaker server does gracefully shut down. It doesn't just turn it off. So that's quite handy. But if anybody does suss out how to actually make this scheduling system work, I would love to know because I've spent a bit of time on it and it was just tedious. Okay. Um, so I guess there's lots of advantages for doing the uh, the Google, the Amazon, the what have you. Uptime's always a good one. But wasn't it just last year that they were down for an afternoon? Um, I think we had lots of Amazon servers suddenly go down for a few hours uh, last year. Can't, can't be sure. Um, okay. Right, there we go. Done. Excellent. Now then, I'm just going to do a quick test, which you won't be able to see. And uh, here. Right, so... Um, what I need to do now, because it's never that easy, is install the little firewall program. Now I'm doing this simply because it means I can block various ports um, if I want to. Here we go. No, 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 not that one. I should just type it instead of copying and pasting, but... Uh, there we go. So this firewall uh, LD, you might pronounce it another way, I have no idea. Uh, it seems to be a very common thing that people like to use. So I install that. It's already installed, which is great. 
and then once it's installed you've got to enable the firewall great now there's no need to enable the ports because Fartmaker's has already done that but what we do need to do is reboot good oh here we go again um now then this is my google cloud ah <laughs> um google password google password here we go uh can't remember so what I'll do is I will cheat and I will do it through uh, the good old Google Cloud interface you've not got a digital piece of paper there Phil with it scribbled down on You're on mute, Phil. Phil, if you can hear, you're on mute. You mean to tell Perfect. me that I've been talking for the past three minutes for no reason? No, it, it's only when you went to the Google Cloud bit you went on mute. All <laughs> oh, right, how odd? How odd? Okay, that's good. See, here we are, Google Cloud. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention, but I'm sure you're aware of: when you first sign up, you get uh, hundreds of pounds worth of credit which is one of the reasons why I went down this route, um, having used up my Amazon credit. Um, and I was quite surprised just how expensive um, it all was, relatively speaking, obviously. So let's uh, stop it. Yeah, great. Phil, have you got a phone near your machine? A mobile phone? Yes. Can you move it? Thank you. Thank you. Go on. Now, four, five feet away. Is that better? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. You know, in Google Cloud, you'll see here we've got an external IP address, which is great, and we can go straight into it. But it's temporary. It will change every time you restart the virtual machine. Luckily, we can go in to the details and change it and make it a fixed IP address. Um, I would imagine, although I'm not completely sure, that there'll be a cost associated with that. Also, as also part of this, <clears throat> sorry? sorry? There's, there's, there's a cost, a cost for, when for when you're not, not using, using it. it. There's a cost for when you're not using it. What, a fixed IP address? Yeah, because you've reserved the IP. Ah, right, I see. I see, yeah. Um, everything seems to have a, a cost associated with it, certainly. Um, ah, yes, yeah, so internally I've got firewall. Th these are just the default firewall rules that they set up. So that's all fine. I'm not going to do any of this. But haven't, haven't set up... Oh, here we go. Let's start it again. Having set up and actively used one of these Google ones, I don't think I would use it again, except for a big company, maybe, um, that needed guarantees and of, of uptime, perhaps, or uh, certain speeds. And, and the thing with me is I'm using it on the cheapest platform that I can find, and the time still does, does rack up. So let's just do a new... SSL session.
it's certainly dead handy being able to spin these things up so quickly. Okay, great. So where was I up to? Let's have a little look. Um, we've done the firewall. We've set it all up. I don't need to do the ports. What I do need to do is see if we can actually connect. So, give me a moment. Let's uh, do a new browser. And let's stick in the IP address. Okay, copy. Good old copy and paste. There we go. Right, cool. Surprised uh, Safari let me in. Ah, okay. Now, if I put in HTTPS at the beginning, will Safari let me in? Well, it'll tell me it's not private, and I can show the details. I can view the certificate, right? Yes, I can visit the website, go for it. Now, once a sample of my DNA to prove that I am who I am. And there we go. Admin. Admin. Um, I've previously said how easy it is to do an SSL certificate and how it just costs pennies, but we'll just do that for now. And I'm going to leave this running. Um, if you want to play with it, you know, fill your boots, do whatever you wish, because um, it's all on my free plan. And once the free plan ends, uh, I won't be renewing it. So that's setting up um, FileMaker Server 19 on the Google platform with all the clever things that uh, Google let you do, um, but with many associated costs. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how interested you are, but I've um, moved a number of people to another company where there are fixed costs. And that's what this... Um, Contabo uh, system is. They're a German company and they've got um, servers in the EU and the USA. Um, the speed seems to be exceptional. The cost seems to be ridiculously cheap. And the setup is very similar, if not easier, because it comes pre installed with, excuse me, whatever version of CentOS you like. Um, and, and you can spin one up really, really quickly. Some of the issues I've had is uploading large numbers of databases, uploading the uh, externally stored data, because you've got to do it all through the command line, So uh, and then setting all the permissions for all the data that you upload. Mm. Today I've uh, installed an FTP server and uploaded the data that way. Um, but you can, once you've done that, you can shut off all the ports, as I say, except for 503, 443, and you can even turn off remote access in the web control panel. And then in order to re-access it again, you go back into the web control panel before you can uh, to turn on remote access. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the security of the system. Um, and yes, we can do encrypted databases. There is some, some issues I had with encrypted databases. If they've got a space in them or a bizarre character, it doesn't just work. You've got to um, escape it. In fact, I never worked out how to escape it in the host name, so I just had to change the names of people's databases to not include a space when they were hosted on uh, CentOS 19. Uh, right, let's close that down. Any questions? Silence. Uh, only, only question I've got, Phil, is um, you're saying about uploading databases. I assume you could upload through FileMaker to it. Yeah, but it doesn't upload, upload the externally stored data files. No, so, I agree. So, yeah, it's dead easy to upload a database. Easy peasy and store it wherever you want but um if they've if they're moving from another server and they've got that uh, all their data stored in that rc folder 
you have to upload that and you can't do that using the file maker interface so i came across two ways of doing it one is to install a gui like gnome which i can go through if you want it's very straightforward and then you can access third-party clouds like OneDrive, for example, and just download all the um, external data through that. Or you can install an FTP server into the uh, CentOS system, which is uh, remarkably straightforward. And you can FTP the data folders up. Then once they're uploaded, you've got to use uh, the command line to move them to the correct place. And you've got to remember that everything's case sensitive. And then that folder has to be has to have the permissions and the uh, the group changed before FileMaker can access it. Now, the first time I did it, I absolutely pissed about for hours with commands, with wondering how to deal with um, seeding to FileMaker space server, um, moving folders changing their groups changing their rewrite permissions but now i've done it once you've done it it's straightforward you know and i was able to do it a second time within minutes so something to watch out for and then of course the ftp service you've got to disable because you know you just don't want to leave that open to the wide world these german people they will tell you how many failed login attempts you've had since the system was up and running uh which is useful because it becomes thousands a day uh right i really can't can't think of okay I, um phil i can see a question here from sky in the chat uh-huh does firewall id show you all the default ports are you using command sudo firewall command list all ah uh, if you want to see all the ports then what i've done is looked at the ip tables um, i haven't got the command to hand um, and i haven't got the the, uh, the manual for firewall uh, handy but i i believe you can what did he say the uh, command was uh sudo firewall dash cmd Space double dash. dash. Sorry, what was it? CMD. Sorry, what was it? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I've got it in the one below. Yeah. yeah. Double dash uh, list double dash, list dash, dash all. all. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, it's uh, not that. Else on that type. You wouldn't think I used to be a typesetter. It's oh. it's in the chat if you want to copy and paste it. I'm sure it's meant to be that. Yeah, I'll have a look in the chat. Did I install the firewall? Hang on. Go to the chat. Let's have a little look. Uh, you just need to do I don't think you can just use firewall, can you? Yeah, because that that's not running. So I need to I need to get that installed and running. Uh, let's quickly do that because it's very easy. Let's just do that, and then let's. Enable it. Okay. Right. And then let's run that uh, command again. Ah. Why is that then? Why is it not running? Ah, because it doesn't run until you reboot the system. Everything is a lot harder than it should be, isn't it? So we'll find the answer to your question very soon. What I'm wondering, when you're talking about migrating databases, just to uh, fill the time in for a moment, 
and a client and when you've got 30 or so users but they deal with all the car insurance companies in the country and the database was put together by the md's son while he was doing a course at uni and they've got several tables uh, several files and in their main table they've got a thousand fields and nobody knows what they're all really used for that's a nightmare to sort out Right, let me, uh, Phil, John, John asked a question. I muted him because I was getting feedback, that's all. But John asked a question about um, Contabo connections to the outside world. What's the speed of it? Well, you, uh, there we go, Rin. I'll show you. I'll tell you what, I found out I've been using um, Own Cloud a lot. Has anybody come across Own Cloud? Nope. No, it's an open source version of OneDrive, basically. Um, if if I go to, um, have I got it set up? Cloud. Um, it's it's definitely worth a look. Own Cloud. It's it's a great way of storing all your files, and there are clients for Mac, PC. Uh, Linux phones, etc., and of course it's it's free. So I set up a bit of hosting with these people. Um, let me just uh, show you. And I found I was getting um, ten to thirty mega second throughput uploading files, whereas with OneDrive I was getting maybe three make a second throughput um, so uh, let me show you the different options that they've got uh, let's go back to their price list actually uh, yeah 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 that's all cool where is the page I'm thinking of oh I know where it is let's uh, let's log in Do a new, uh, new order. Here we go. So, this will give you um, an idea of the bandwidth on this section here. And I'm not going for a one more than um, this at the minute, 15 euros a month. And you get incredible performance. I wish I was their affiliate. <laughs> but I'm not. I have no affiliation at all. I've just come across them. I tried a number of different companies. All of them wanted to take my back teeth out as soon as I started going for large amounts of storage because I had a client who had um, um, uh, a terabyte of storage that they wanted to move. I set it up with these people, installed own cloud, and um, they're laughing all the way at the bank. They love it. It's great. Okay, I think, I think Phil, that's, that's, that's great. That's, that's been great. really helpful. I think we're gonna we're yeah, a bit short on time. time. Yeah, yeah. We're, a, we're, we're a way behind there the, at the moment. So any, if any people want to talk about this later, email? I don't know if you're going to be around later to carry on after at the end. Uh, it may well be. Okay. Well, let's um. There we go. Move move on to mine swiftly. Thank you very much. That's a pleasure. pleasure. Uh, and thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, uh, I feel just... it was a bit rushed and, and uh, stuttered, but uh, I'll do better next time. <laughs> oh, we got the idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna be even worse. I'm gonna rush this next one now, which is the one on uh, why you authenticate using OAuth. Um, so if you just bear with me a moment uh i think that's no not that one uh not that screen uh different screen um that 
that one. Okay. Um, this was prompted by um, a talk that I listened to uh, at um, .fmp, which a few of you are at. Uh, excellent talk by Wim, which made me think about OAuth because I've been thinking about OAuth before. I'm not going to reiterate uh, Wim's talk, although I might try and see if I can get him to do one here if he's uh, if he's willing and everyone's interested. Uh, but I might go through some of the salient points. There is a, I'll make uh, just generally, if everyone wants, anyone wants all these links and any of the presenters want to send me stuff to put up, I will make them available on the website so people can get to them. Um, and these are just some bits of information that I found useful. There's Wim's original blog there, um, as, a, as a blog by Fire Medical Pro Gurus there. Um, the white paper is available. You can just download that, which is a, an excellent white paper. And uh, there's quite an interesting infographic, which I will show you a bit of in a moment. Uh, I'm going to rush through this, so please, please stop me if, uh, if I'm rushing too much. Uh, that will probably be Gary shouting at me saying, you'll be going too fast or you'll shut up. <laughs> One of the two. So just a quick question. What is authentication versus authorization? Because some people, some people seem to get confused. Authentication is who are you and are you who you say you are? Authorization is what are you allowed to do? So what we're concerned with here in our auth is authentication. This is the um, slide from uh, um, that I was talking about before, that uh, infographic. It's a little section. This is where we are at the moment with um, authentica authentication. Um, there's lots of fancy bits and pieces, but everything is basically done when you enter the system. So it's your login to FileMaker or whatever. Uh, and, and in this case, it'd probably be outside FileMaker. Uh, one login is one of the many ID providers out there. Some you pay a lot for, some are free. Um, this is where we're going, this bottom one. Um, in Wim's opinion, I think I probably agree with him, uh, is contextual continuous authentication. So your system will be continually querying you um, as to see if you're really who you are when you're logged into a system. Um, and that will be ongoing throughout the thing. So every time you make an API call, that will probably happen. You'll be authenticated by your phone or whatever device it is. Uh, if it is a phone, it'll be, are you with your owner? Is it really you? Um, and that will be an ongoing process. And I think, as I understand it, FileMaker is probably going to move in that direction. I don't know, maybe John has some more information on that. I don't know. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, John. <laughs> uh, hopefully they'll be up there. So uh, with FileMaker 16, um, we had these this new little section introduced on FileMaker Server of uh, being able to authenticate with Azure AD, Amazon, and Google. Um, Unfortunately, Amazon and Google don't include groups, which is quite annoying and pretty useless, really, um, which makes Azure the only one. Um, but what really happens when you do that is it uses OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. So that's the key word, key phrase to look for is, that's where I was on, the, on this one, I'll be moving it around, is uh, OpenID Connect. So what Wim was talking about is using the structure within the Azure AD uh, authentication provided by FileMaker and manipulating that to use anything that is capable of using OpenID Connect. Um, and this really applies at the moment to on-premise only because I don't know if I've got another graphic there. When did have another graphic? Um, Basically, the only options, I can't remember if I put this on the next slide. Yes, I did. Authentication in CloudMaker Cloud 2 at the moment is limited to Okta and ADFS. 
but it does have FileMaker ID, which I don't know if they're going to move both ways with that. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, so something that Wim mentioned that I'd completely forgotten about, and I think it's worth mentioning here, is that there's a very, very simple way of doing group authentication in FileMaker when you're talking about small companies and small numbers of users. Uh, allows you to allows your IT manager to administer uh, users and groups without touching FileMaker, and all you as a dev need to do is identify what the, the names of those groups and match them to the group names in your system. Now it works on Windows and Mac, uh, and you set it up on the server machine, not your local machine, because people get confused with that. And all you have to do is set up groups and accounts locally. So that's just go into System Preferences on a Mac. Users and groups, set up your groups and users. And FileMaker, provided you've turned it on in the admin console, which is just one little tick box to set client authentication to FileMaker and all external server accounts, will allow you, and you set up the account names, sorry, the groups in FileMaker itself into in your solution, will allow you to authenticate um, using groups. So, uh, a good handy tip. So Wim's talk was really about using uh, Key Cloak as he decided that he wanted to have his uh, UB key authenticate him straight into FileMaker with no password or anything. Um, and he chose Key Cloak because it's free, uh, it's open source. Uh, so it's sponsored by Red Hat, so it's been around a while and it will keep around for a, a while yet. Um, and it runs on Linux, and Docker, etc. Um, if you can't, don't fancy getting your hands dirty in the code, which isn't as bad now that someone like Wim has done all the work and made it freely available to the rest of us. Um, you can use something like uh, orthocop.com, who uh, offer a good free tier, so you don't actually have to get too dirty with the authentication. Uh, and in Wim's example, he was running Cloak on in Linux on a T2 Micro using Amazon Web Server. I can't remember where his server was hosted. I think it was on Amazon, but it doesn't really matter. Um, he was using the AWS DNS server, but I guess it doesn't matter which server you use for that DNS server. And he is using a GoDaddy SSL. That was the area he had the most problem with. Um, and it needs to be an SS. You need an SSL in both Keycloak and the FM server. Just to just to reiterate, Keycloak is an identity provider. So for the user, what they see when they open the database, is they see the usual dialogue and they get this bit that says, or sign in with Microsoft. Unfortunately, you can't change Microsoft at the moment, but I'm sure that will change eventually to allow us to put in some other stuff, hopefully. Um, what that does from the user's point of view, it opens their web browser, and allows them to authenticate with whatever method their ID provider is using. This could be interesting. It could be Google um, with a group because you set up your groups in Keycloak. It could be any authentication system you want, so long as it uses, um, which we look back here, it was, I um, was in that one, wasn't it? I open ID Connect, just to remind you. Uh, so the user goes through the identity authentication process and if they're authenticated FileMaker lets them in uh, and Wim has had a, a very good demo on how you actually do that using a UB key so he just plugged it into the side of his machine logged into FileMaker touched his key and he was in no password just a username it was brilliant so um, just a very brief outline of what you need to do in the admin console, you um, go to the administration section, external auth authentication, uh, Microsoft, enter any values that you need, uh, any values at all. Um, so you can just enter test, 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 and three fields. And under the hood, what FileMaker Server does is it sets up a block in the XML, a block of XML in the configuration file, which is called DBS config XML. Um, which you're then going to muck about with and change to your own custom settings if you're going to do it this way. You uh, set up your, IP, IP, your ID provider, such as Keycloak, 
with all the options there, including your groups and your group names. Um, in Clee Cloak, you actually have to create a new uh, resource that's called groups because they call it something slightly different. But you could do that in the config file, interestingly. Uh, edit the config file, which you can then copy and paste into future um, developments, updates, whatever. So it's very easy once you've done it once. Restart the server. Ensure you've got matching groups in your solution files. Uh, and what FileMaker is looking for in the identity code that is returned is just email and groups. So this is what FileMaker knows after you've done all that. It knows your email address. It usually is. Well, it's usually the email address that you've used to identify yourself because it's different. Uh, the account name, which might be the email address or might just be the username before the e uh, the at symbol in the email. Uh, it knows the privilege set for the group that you've entered with. It knows the, the group, which is the Azure AD group you set up and it will tell you the account type is as here. So you can retrieve all that information using the, the get functions. So that gives you true passwordless entry into FileMaker. Uh, after that whistle stop introduction, the questions that I thought would be interesting to talk about would be, why would you use OAuth? I think we've had some answers to that already uh, in what people have said earlier. Does this have an advan advantages in multi-file situations where you've got to change a lot of things if you do it the traditional way? Can you change less using uh, OAuth? And is it more secure than external accounts, file maker, built-in name and password? I'll throw it back to you lot. Uh, I'll leave this slide up. Anyone got I'll start me? With one. I'll start points. with one for you, um, Joel. Yeah. Um, is it more secure? There's two sides to that. I would say with the, um, if you're linking it to say AD or something like that, I think yes, if you're in a large organization, it, it's not necessarily about the security. It's probably a lot easier to manage. Um, uh, the advantage is, is you can set password policies up within AD and those sort of credentials. So if, if a company then is rotating their passwords every 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, which is up for question. Some of the security advisors advise you not to change your password. Um, it will obviously authenticate back to the server. So there's no password management needed. So it makes life easy. Um, is it more secure? Well, you could argue, um, certainly us as IT, we have full access to all the AD. Uh, we don't have access to the password, but I can reset someone's password in seconds, mm -hmm. um, which means I can now access the FileMaker database as that user. So do question that, do consider that. Um, certainly from if you're putting it into a central system, you would hope the IT departments have their own policies that they don't have users that would circumvent systems and, and do it. All my staff, are, they have to sign NDAs, they have to sign documentation to prove that they are not going to then filtrate data out and that it will be monitored as far as their user accounts are monitored when they log into things. So, so from that side of view, from a security angle, um, I would say it's as secure as the systems that a company would normally have within their organization anyhow. So it makes life easier. So there's no real reason I can see not to use it. So. I think yeah. off the back of, back of that, Gary and Joel, the, the other thing as well is if you're using things like Microsoft, you get the inbuilt two-factor you get the, yeah. the you, you need well in fact you get the you get the two factor with the pin to the phone if you want or you can actually stipulate at an organization level that you have to use the authenticator app um as well so i think in terms of security uh, it's far far you have far superior uh, security yeah. options going through this method yeah and i think you, you then have the full range of options of choosing which provider you want and which method with that provider that you want so you yeah. can satisfy your own security requirements that way. Yeah. Just to be clear on that, Jordan, just to highlight that and um, extend on that, if you have single sign-on already done anyhow, because you've already authenticated with the app, FileMaker would just adopt that? Uh, no. Or is it not? No, no I don't so, think it is. So from what we found in Joe, if anybody's getting any experience, the, the, the OAuth isn't, doesn't have the same functionality and features as single sign-on. Um, so even if you've signed in, even if you've signed into 365 as an example, we, we, to be honest, we only use a 365. But if you're signed in through 365, even if you're signed in and you've already signed into FileMaker for that day, as soon as you shut down the file and try and log back in, you have to go through the whole 
authentication process. Um, the okay. only difference is, is if you've authenticated, if you've already done two-factor with 365, you don't, you're not asked to do two-factor again with FileMaker. Okay. Okay. Okay, anyone else? Utter silence. <laughs> <laughs> what about multi-file situations? Do you, I mean, do you think it's this? If you go the OAuth route, um, do you think it has advantages? Anyone in having to do less work within FileMaker in your individual FileMaker databases? Because we all know that managing users when you've got three hundred users is a nightmare. Hey. I would have said if you've got multi files, then it, it comes down to how you set those files up, doesn't it? It comes down to the groups and the levels you set up within those multi files. It shouldn't make any difference. If your whole infrastructure is set up for it, it should just work. My point is if you have half your system working and then half your system not working, but then you have instances where solution A talks to a file in, in section B that's not got it, I assume you're just going to be presented with a password box because it's not going to yeah. authenticate across that. So, uh, yeah, I think I think I mean there's, there's 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 multiple advantages. I mean a huge advantage from a from a from a developer customer relationship is is compliance. Is that you're you if if they if they're already using Azure AD or AD Connect or or local AD, then you're already getting a tick in a box from their IT department. Um, uh, which is always, always super helpful, um, and uh, yeah, as, as Gary, as, as you just said, that 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 management aspect of it is that all the management goes away. You, you you can, in theory, you can push all the management back onto IT. Um, yeah. One thing to be aware of, which is a slight pain, um, is that when you authenticate via OAuth three three six five, you don't inherit the users. Uh, 365 username you you, in, you inherit their email address so when you log on the the get account name is is the email address not the person's use, username i so, think i think jordan if you do what Wim was suggesting and use a, a third party id an provider, interim, yeah an interim, you can get around that problem by not allowing that and insisting on the username yeah yeah, to me, it, it, it makes a lot of sense because you can comply with individual company policies and FileMaker is no longer the maverick system that requires its own security outside. Exactly. One of the other big wins that we found with, um, like we, we use 365 Azure, is the ability to have one place to lock people out of all of the accounts. So if you have a, a, a rogue person or someone that you, that's, I mean, when we've had people on furlough, all we have to do is is change the the block their Azure account, and that locks them out of Azure email, Teams, um, FileMaker solutions, just with that one point, rather than having to deal with I'll oh, go to FileMaker and lock them out of there. Go that it's a it's a single point to to be able to manage that rather than multiple different points. Yeah, and, and there's, with that kind yeah. as well, you can also set with. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking specifically three six five because it's the, the main one that we use. But but you can set that that um, how many times you want somebody to to try and try their password before you lock them out for a period. So so yeah, basically you get the whole, uh, what's what's interesting about three six five. If anybody's on it, there is a whole compliance sec section under the admin console, which guides you step by step through with all your security compliance. So Gary, your point around um, not asking people to reset the passwords, if you go in 365 and admin console and compliance, I think the third one down is you can set a, a, an expiry password policy, but Microsoft yeah. recommends you not to with the newest security update. It basically, I think there's 64 points that it, it guides you through. Um, so if you use it, it basically makes your file maker system secure just by going yeah. down the checklist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a that was an interesting, if rapid, discussion. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan, for your input, and Gary um, and Clive. Uh, I think we'd best move on now to um, the next thing on the agenda, which is, if you're ready and you're still there, Robin, is uh, is your presentation on Claris Connect. Ian, we're running about half an hour behind. 
<laughs> He's smiling and then thinking, my food's getting cold. <laughs> yeah, mine's non existent at the moment. <laughs> I'm fine with the first part. I may need to sort of either the second part, sort of after it was scheduled for after nine, I may need to do either really, really quickly or uh, bail on and do another time. But I'm good for the first time. We, 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 we can do that, whichever works for people. Uh, Robin, are you around there somewhere? I am indeed. Um, do you want to take over and go yeah, ahead? Certainly. Can you see the first slide? Yes. Yep. Can. All is good. Well, good evening. Uh, my name's Robin Penfold. I run a FileMaker business called PowerPlay Projects. We're based in North Essex, but with clients in London. Certified in versions 13 to 17. I've been exploring Claris Connect over the recent weeks. Have it at the testing stage in a client project and working very well. They said of the laser that it was a solution looking for a problem. Claris Connect has that same quality. My aim here is to give a whistle-stop summary of each of the 50-odd connectors currently available and to stir up ideas of the problems that Claris Connect might solve. It's remarkably powerful, reasonably intuitive most of the time, and is much faster than the equivalent API integration where the connector and functionality exists. In most cases, it should allow you to deliver more functionality faster. Pricing based on value to the client, that's a definite win for us. For a specific connector, Claris Connect does not necessarily make all functionality accessible. There may still be some functionality accessible through the API that is not accessible through Claris Connect. Some connectors have long lists of triggers and actions. Some have short lists. I hope that more of the functionality within the connector will be added over time. There may be functionality mentioned in the following descriptions that is not currently accessible within Claris Connect. Most of the following descriptions come from the company websites. The pricing makes Claris Connect very accessible. The developer package is a small monthly charge, around £20, but limited to 500 API calls. For clients who have FileMaker already, it's about £40 a month. The client I asked about using it said it was a no-brainer and signed up straight away. For those who already have FileMaker, there are no limits on flows or connections with a limit of 10,000 API calls per month, and you can buy expansion packs for more API calls. Claris Connect is based on flows, and flows sit within a specific project. Every flow begins with a trigger event. It's then followed by one or more actions. Most connectors have both triggers and actions, some just triggers or actions. The focus here today is on a summary of the connectors. Lynda.com has a solid Chris ipper like training course detailing the nuts and bolts of working with Claris Connect that I'd highly recommend, and Productive Computing University also has a course that looks strong. Claris Connect has within it a number of utilities that enable the manipulation of JSON from triggers and actions. And in the case of FTP, SFTP, and HTTP within webhooks, allow Claris Connect to also connect with additional external services. Two of these utilities are particularly significant in this overview. Schedules can be set up as a trigger, allowing you to run flows hourly, daily, weekly, monthly, or on a custom basis using a cron expression. The actions within schedules means a flow will wait for or until certain scenarios before continuing. Webhooks provides powerful trigger and action functionality. When you set up a webhook trigger, it auto generates a URL that can be copied. When this is called, the flow will fire. You can send blocks of JSON to this webhook that can then be accessed within the rest of the flow. Webhooks provide an industry standard way for third-party applications to call Claris Connect flows. Within Actions, the Webhooks utility also provides get, post, patch, and put functionality, enabling a flow to make API calls to other services. Utilities also includes powerful approval functionality. This sends an email to a specified recipient, pausing the flow and resuming it once they have approved or rejected the request. You can specify a title, description, and recipient email address, drawing in values from the trigger, or previous actions as required, optionally linking to an, addition, uh, to an additional attachment file. You then specify the due date for the approval. 
When the flow runs, it will send the approval email to the recipient and then pause. The recipient receives an email that allows them to enter a comment and then approve or reject the request. Claris Connect then receives the approval or rejection. The JSON approved rejected status can be accessed to determine the actions in the rest of the flow. The approver comment is also returned. Now we move on to look at the connectors to third-party services. Active Campaign gives you the email marketing, marketing automation, and CRM tools you need to create incredible customer experiences. Reach and engage, nurture and educate, convert and close, support and grow, starting from $9 a month paid yearly. Asana, keep your team coordinated wherever you are. With Asana, remote teams can organize projects, manage shifting priorities, and get work done. Lay out your team's goals, plans, and responsibilities in one shared space and get the flexibility to switch between project views. Basic package, free forever. Autopilot, marketing automation software made visual. Create customer journeys that capture and convert new leads. Capture new leads from your website, app, or blog, and then nurture them with personalized messages. Automate repetitive tasks like educating new subscribers, assigning leads, booking appointments, and following up sales leads. Design customer experiences that create repeat buyers and loyal customers. Free 30-day trial, £39.20 a month, paid annually for 2,000 contacts, unlimited emails, chat, and email support. AWS Lambda lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. You pay only for the compute time you consume. With Lambda, you can run code for virtually any type of application or back-end service, all with zero administration. Just upload your code, and Lambda takes care of everything required to run and scale your code with high availability. Pay as you go. Amazon's simple storage service. Object storage built to store and retrieve any amount of data from anywhere and offers industry-leading scalability, data availability, security, and performance. This means customers of all sizes and industries can use it to store and protect any amount of data for a range of use cases, such as websites, mobile applications, backup and restore, archive, enterprise applications, IoT devices, and big data analytics. Pay as you go. Amazon's simple email service is a cost-effective, flexible, and scalable email service that enables developers to send mail from within any application. You can configure Amazon SES quickly to support several email use cases, including transactional, marketing, or mass email communications. Amazon's SES flexible IP deployment and email authentication options help drive higher deliverability and protect sender reputation while sending analytics Measure the impact of each email. With Amazon SES, you can send emails securely, globally, and at scale. Amazon's simple notification service, SNS, is a highly available, durable, secure, fully managed pub-sub messaging service that enables you to decouple microservices, distributed systems, and serverless applications. Amazon SNS provides topics for high-throughput, push-based, many-to-many messaging. Using Amazon SNS topics, your publisher systems can fan out messages to a large number of subscriber endpoints for parallel processing, including Amazon SQS queues, AWS Lambda functions, and HTTPS webhooks. Additionally, SNS can be used to fan out notifications to end users using mobile push, SMS, and email. Amazon's simple queue service is a fully managed message queuing service that enables you to decouple and scale microservices, distributed systems, and a serverless and serverless applications. SQS eliminates the complexity and overhead associated with managing and operating message-oriented middleware and empowers developers to focus on differentiating work. Using SQS, you can send, store, and receive messages between software components at any volume without losing messages or requiring other services to be available. Box, simplify how you work. Secure collaboration with anyone, anywhere, on any device. Protecting your sensitive files in the cloud for seamless collaboration and simplified workflow. Calend Calendly helps you schedule meetings without the back and forth emails. Create simple rules, share your link, they pick a time, and the event is added to your calendar. Clearbit is the marketing data engine for all of your customer interactions. Deeply understand your customer's identity, future prospects, and personalize every single marketing and sales interaction. See the full picture from the get-go so you're prepared to reach the right people, make great first impressions, and nurture relationships throughout their life cycle. 
The world's best companies use Clearbit to become truly data-driven. Flexible for your business, pricing is based on CRM database size, monthly web traffic, and monthly contact creation. DocParser. The ability to pass very specific data from documents is the number one reason customers are using DocParser. Say goodbye to manual data entry and automate your business. Invoice and accounts payable processing, shipping orders and delivery notes, bank statements, fillable PDF form processing, and many more. Free package, 30 passing credits, ideal for those with smaller passing needs or for anyone who wants to test out all of the features. DocuSign, it's time to agree better. Your organization runs on contracts and other types of agreements. It's time to transform how you prepare, sign, act on, and manage them. A suite of applications and integrations for automating and connecting the entire agreement process. Electronic signature, contract lifecycle management, document generation and negotiation, agreement analytics. Lower your costs, save time, and elevate the customer experience. Save on average 30 pounds in time and materials per agreement. 80% faster turnaround time from eight pound per month for personal use, single user only. Dropbox, be organized. Bring traditional files, cloud content, Dropbox paper docs and web shortcuts together in one place and work the way that works for you. Stay focused. Personalized suggestions give you files and folders when you need them so you spend less time searching. Get in sync. Coordinate with your team and move projects forward with the tools you use every day, all within Dropbox. From 10 pounds per user per month for Teams. Eventbrite is a US-based event management and ticketing website. The service allows users to browse, create, and promote local events. The service charges a fee to event organizers in exchange for online ticketing services, unless the event is free. FileMaker Server, workplace innovation super powerhouse. Claris Connect can connect to FileMaker Cloud, FileMaker Server, and has a special additional install to enable access to on-premise installations that aren't open to the internet. You can set up connections to multiple different servers and files within a project, and as many of these as required within a single flow. A few thoughts on actually accessing the server. It works through the data API, so the things you've learned about accessing the data API are all relevant. You must have a valid SSL certificate on the server, must have FM REST turned on on the specific account. Authenticating account must have access to the referenced files, layouts, data, and scripts. Claris Connect requests come from a number of different IP addresses currently in the US. You may need to get these set up on your firewall. It also seems to me that you could just uh, use a webhook to trigger rather than actually um, using the, the FileMaker server trigger itself. Claris Connect triggers. It details how to set up the trigger and gives the unique URL to be called in the insert from URL script within FileMaker. The most basic script steps within FileMaker, set a variable called data JSON with a key action with a value script, then add any other data you want to. Copy and paste the curl requests as detailed in Claris Connect, then use insert from URL. Most of the actions require hard coding field names, et cetera, which feels vulnerable. If the names change, you end up with a lot of problems. The execute script minimizes the amount that gets hard coded. I have a Claris Connect script and a Claris Connect layout, which I know not to rename. They get referenced and they can then reference anything else without hard coding. Moving on. FormStack's workplace productivity software brings your data collection and signatures online. Break down process, process barriers and keep your business moving forward. A versatile online form builder for everyone. Get more from your data. Say goodbye to manual work and let them do the heavy lifting. Create seamless workflows to increase workplace productivity. Send out email notifications. Get projects approved. All automated. Always easy. Powerful, powerful solutions for teams of all shapes and sizes. Free trial from $19 a month, one user, five forms. Freshdesk, delight your customers and win them for life. Looking for omni-channel, bots, and self-service solutions for customer service? They've got you covered. With Freshdesk, you can streamline all your customer conversations in one place, automate your repetitive work and save time, collaborate with other teams to resolve issues faster and much more. Delightfully named packages, sprout, blossom, garden, estate, and forest 
Sprout package is free for unlimited agents. Google Calendar is a time management and scheduling calendar service developed by Google. With Google Calendar, you can quickly schedule meetings and events and get reminders about upcoming activities so you always know what's next. Calendar is designed for teams, so it's easy to share your schedule with others and create multiple calendars that you and your team can use together. Google Drive is a free cloud-based storage service that enables users to store and access files online. The service syncs stored documents, photos, and more across all of the user's devices, including mobile devices, tablets, and desktop. Google Drive integrates with the company's other services and systems, including Google Docs, Gmail, Android, Chrome, YouTube, Google Analytics, and Google+. Google Maps is a web mapping service developed by Google. It offers satellite imagery and aerial photography, street maps, 360-degree interactive panoramic views of streets, real-time traffic conditions, and route planning for traveling by foot, car, bicycle, and air, or public transportation. Google Sheets is a spreadsheet program included as part of a free web-based software office suite offered by Google within its Google Drive service. Google Translate is a free multilingual statistical and neural machine translation service developed by Google to translate text and websites from one language into another. HubSpot. Marketing, sales, and service software that helps your business grow without compromise. HubSpot offers a full stack of software for marketing, sales, and customer service with a completely free CRM at its core. They're powerful alone, but even better when used together. CRM, everything you need to organize, track, and build better relationships with leads and customers. And yes, it's 100% free forever. CMS Hub, Marketing Hub, Sales Hub, and Service Hub. £33.60 per month, paid annually, 1000 contacts within the additional services. MailChimp, bring your audience data, marketing channels, and insights together so you can reach your goals faster. With MailChimp, you can promote your business across email, social, shoppable landing pages, postcards, and more, all from a single platform. Build campaigns in minutes. They'll help you get up and running with pre-built templates, ready-made segments, and one-click automations. With their intuitive design tools, it's easy to create beautiful campaigns that put your brand in the spotlight free package, all the basics for business, for businesses that are just getting started. Mailgun, powerful services that enable you to send, receive, and track email effortlessly. Free sandbox domain for practicing. Mailparser, users forward emails with data trapped in the body or attachments to the email parser. Mailparser extracts all relevant data fields based on the custom parsing rules, Data gets automatically sent to applications or is available to download. Zero per month, unlimited passing rules, unlimited integrations, unlimited downloads, 30 emails a month, 10 inboxes, other more substantial packages available. MS SQL Server allows you to execute queries in this heavyweight database application. MySQL Server allows you to execute queries in this industry standard database, it includes running in on-premise installations. Outlook, solid familiar email functionality and great for smaller volume or highly personal emailing tasks. Particle, meet the only all-in-one IoT platform on the market. Everything you need to power your IoT product from device to cloud. Fully managed, built to scale, data autonomy, secure by default, accessible, all-in-one solution. 21.9 billion sensor data points collected per year. 100 free Wi-Fi devices, $1.29 per month after that. Cellular, cellular devices, extra costs. Pipedrive. When you need to stay laser focused on the right deals, Pipedrive is there to support you. Manage leads and deals, track communications, automate and grow, insights and reports, privacy and security, mobile apps and integrations. Try for free, £12.50 per user month, basic package. PubNub. I had to go to Wikipedia to make sense of what PubNub does. PubNub is a real-time communication platform and real-time infrastructure as a service company. They make products for software and hardware developers to build real-time web, mobile, and IoT applications. From their website, connecting a remote world, build the remote interactions that bring us back together. In-app chat, alerts and notifications, IoT device control. Meeting your unique application needs, the only real-time communication platform with embedded business logic and integration capabilities. Third-party integrations, 
language translation, content moderation, push notifications, and other best in class third party services. Business logic, filter, profanity, keywords, etc. Pass and route based on message content or user status. AI and aggregation, chatbots, natural language processing, sentiment analysis, and other AI enabled services. $49 a month prepaid towards usage, additional charges based on usage. QuickBooks, smart, simple accounting software, support when you need it most, trusted by 4.5 million small businesses, a complete overview of cash flow. From five pounds a month for six months, 12 pounds after that. SendGrid, send with confidence, promotional emails, shipping notifications, email newsletters, password resets, et cetera, et cetera. Over 80,000 paying customers trust SendGrid to send more than 60 billion emails every month. Free package, 100 emails a day forever. 750 pounds ish a month for 1.5 million emails and other packages in between. Slack brings the team together wherever you are. With all of your communication and tools in one place, remote teams will stay productive no matter where you're working from. With 10,000 searchable messages, 10 apps and integrations, one-to-one -one video calls and two-factor authentication, the free version gives your team access to Slack's basic features. £5.25 per user month billed annually for standard features. Stripe bills itself as the best software platform for running an internet business. They handle billions of dollars every year for forward-thinking businesses around the world. Stripe builds the most powerful and flexible tools for internet commerce. Whether you're creating a subscription service, an on-demand marketplace, an e-commerce store, or a crowdfunding platform, Stripe's meticulously designed APIs and unmatched functionality help you create the best possible product for your users. Millions of the world's most innovative technology companies are scaling faster and more efficiently by building their businesses on Stripe. 1.4% plus 20 pence for European card payments, 2.9% plus 20 pence for international card payments. Trello lets you work more collaboratively and get more done. Trello's boards, lists, and cards enable you to organize and prioritize your projects in a fun, flexible, and rewarding way. Work with any team, information at a glance, built in workflow automation, free to start with. Twilio, build the new normal. Engage customers on any channel, any time. Strengthen your customer relationships by uniting communications across your entire business, from marketing and sales to customer service and operations. Personalize every step of the customer journey with solutions like intelligent chatbots, custom account notifications, a completely programmable cloud-based call center, and more. Pay-as-you-go pricing. Twitter, functionality to tweet, retweet, and search, and to manage users in this most ubiquitous of social media platforms. Typeform, turn a list of questions into a friendly conversation and get better data. Bring questions to life, free access to millions of images and videos, movement and dynamism within the forms. Make it yours. With custom layouts, you'll put your best foot forward every time. From 28 pounds per month, 1,000 responses per month. UPS, manage shipments and rates when working with this global delivery company. Wufu, Build custom online forms that you can use to collect data, payments, and to automate your workflows. Build powerful online forms and customize them to your heart's delight. Their form builder gives you an award-winning interface, easy customization, galleries, templates, and reporting. Getting started is free. They offer different plan options depending on your needs, including an always free plan. Check out their pricing page for more details. And finally, Zendesk. This support, sales, and custom engagement software is quick to implement and easily scales to meet changing needs. With Zendesk, it takes hours, not weeks, to get up and running. Support suite, support, guide, chat, and talk. Sales suite, sell, explore, gather, and connect. Support suite starting at five pounds per agent. New connectors have already been added in the few months since Claris Connect was released. There are four new connectors listed as coming soon as well. SurveyMonkey, a global leader in survey software, 20 million questions answered daily. Know the score with your customers. Keep a competitive edge by truly understanding the voice of your customers. Customer satisfaction surveys help you connect at multiple touch points to find out exactly what your customers want, need, and expect. Microsoft Teams, industry standard collaboration tools. Zero. Stop chasing unpaid invoices, reconciling seconds, stay connected to your business. Shopify, build an online business no matter what business you're in. One platform with all the e-commerce and point of sale features you need to start, run and grow your business. Sell everywhere, market your business, manage everything.
I hope that a few more of these icons are now familiar and that that's given a good flavor of what's currently possible in Claris Connect, maybe triggering some ideas of how you can solve current problems. Hopefully they're also in the back of your mind when considering possible solutions to future challenges as well. Do drop me an email if you have any questions. Thank you. That's great, Robin. Thank you very much indeed. That was, uh, that was a whistle-stop tour with some really useful information in there. I think, uh, I hope some people are going to be inspired by that. Uh, it's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are you going to be hanging around after for a, to, for a while, or um, yep. do you need any questions now? No, I'm, I'm, I'll be loitering. <coughs> so, just are there quick, any quick Just very quickly, Joel. Very quickly, yeah. Joel, I was just going to say, I'm, I don't know if everyone's on the chat, but I'm actually recording this anyhow. So, um, so thanks for that, Robin. You've got all the slides on there. So if you want to go over the stuff and you think, oh, that's the thing, but I didn't see the slide because you flew through it, hopefully you can get it back on the video afterwards. So nice one. Thanks, Robin. Cheers. Pleasure. Yeah. Any other quick comments or questions before we move on? No. Nope. OK. Um, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, our last presentation, which may or may not happen in two parts and may only have the first part, depending on how hungry Ian is and how tired he is. <laughs> so over to you, Ian. Can't hear you at the moment. OK, I'm just uh, yep. Can you hear me now. Yep, you're fine. You're good. OK, can everyone see my screen? Yep. What can we learn from not hot dog? Yeah. OK, um, first off, is, is sort of everyone familiar with um, hot dog, not hot dog from Silicon Valley, the TV show? Only from your last presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of why I've used this as the, um, I guess, the basis for this. So I'll just start the presentation then. I'll just um, introduce myself for those who don't know, because I think there's a fair number of people on here I've not actually met. Um, I'm Ian Jemson, been using FileMaker since version 3, certified on version 18, and a few older versions. Um, about seven years ago, I kind of moved, moved away from FileMaker to um, when a, a client offered me a position where I basically worked on everything from internal systems with million millions of records to um, sort of doing the comms architecture for um, one of the major UK high street banks when we um, when we changed um, to incorporating email. The last three years I've been doing my MBA at Warwick Business School and my dissertation was on the strategic implications of artificial intelligence. So after that, in April, April 1st, April Fool's Day, I founded Transforming Digital and the aim of the company was to build um, an ML-based document management product. But um, with uh, everything that's gone on, um, VC funding has sort of dried up. So I find myself doing consulting to um, while we're building the product. So um, what we're going to talk about is FileMaker 19 and machine learning. Um, it's fairly restricted in terms of what it can do. Um, Basically, it deals with core ML models only, which means it's Macintosh and iOS only, so no Windows. Um, it does work with perform script on server and schedule scripts on a Macintosh server, and it's restricted to using existing machine learning models. So you're not able to edit a model as you go um, without using other methods. If I describe some of the capabilities of machine learning, and then we can sort of see where FileMaker fits in. There's four broad capabilities. We've got regression, where we can predict a continuous value, such as house prices or, or incomes. Classification, where you're predicting a label for an, in, for an input. So classifying email as spam or identifying people in a photograph. Um, the last two, recognizing and generating sequences, are used for things like language translation, learning a strategy to reach a goal. You've probably seen some of the examples, such as playing Go or video games. Um, the last two basically fall completely beyond the capabilities of what we can do with FileMaker. So we're pretty much limited to using regression models to predict values, 
or classification. Most of the examples Falmic has shown, um, or Claris have shown, have been classification. And within that, we've rarely got three strands. So we've got supervised learning, where we combine training data with an algorithm to produce a model. Unsupervised learning, where we group data by patterns contained within the data. And reinforcement learning, where a model will learn from the feedback from the environment. So primarily, we'll be dealing, looking at the first of those, where training, we're looking at uh, models generated from, with training data. And so supervised learning looks roughly like this. We've got training data combined with an algorithm and a variety of parameters going through a training process, and that results in a trained model. This simplifies it a fair bit, but it gives you the basic idea that the model is an artifact produced from a combination of training data and the algorithm. Core ML, which FileMaker is built on, is an Apple technology. And it basically sits as a layer within the Mac OS and iOS that allows applications to very easily um, incorporate um, machine learning. So it basically provides a standardized way for vision, natural language, speech, and sound analysis models to um, access lower level functionality. So we've got a core ML model, which basically were the core ML within the, the OS, and then the application call it. So FileMaker in this case would be the app. So within FileMaker, we contain, have our model in a container field. We have a new script step called configure machine learning model that loads the model. We apply the model using a compute model function, which is also new. And that accepts inputs and outputs a prediction. And then we again use configure machine learning model to unload the machine learning model at the end. So the script step, um, this is all going to be, by the way, not all key, keynote. Uh, I'm going to get on to uh, FileMaker in a second. This basically just sort of, we've got three options. We've got image, general, and then we can unload model. So we need a, a model name, which is a reference to the model. The model is in a container field. And then basically, we can test whether there's an error when we loaded the model. The compute model function accepts a model name, and then the inputs. The inputs are basically paired, in, paired parameters. So we've got, and in the case of image models, it's always image. And then the image field is a value one. There are, it's important to note that the documentation is incorrect, but the release notes are correct. The documentation refers to a parameter called threshold, and that should actually be confidence lower limit. Um, and what I discovered is that the parameters, confidence lower limit, and return at least one are actually case sensitive, which is kind of a a unique thing for FileMaker and caused me a bit of trouble just before I did my .fmp presentation. And I'll get back to this in a second. So if we now go to FileMaker, okay. Sorry. Um, I've built a small database. What we've got is we've got a number of models loaded into it. So I've got 14 core ML models that I've loaded, and then predictions. So in this case, we've got an image of a hot dog. We've basically selected a model that's going to be applied to it. The input is this image. And if we say predict, you can see that what we get is um, a classification, we get adjacent result. Basically, we've got the classification saying it's a hot dog, and the model is 99.9% .9 certain of that. You can see other possibilities it's considered, and you can see that the, the probability of the being grilled someone is incredibly low. So if I just look at, we've got another image of a hot dog say predict, and you'll see again that this is very certain that it's a hot dog. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of examples. And then we've got sort of, in this case, a flower classifier. And we can predict 
what that gives us. So it's 90, in this case, less certain. It thinks it's a sweet pea. Uh, no idea if it is or not, but that's what it thinks. Um, I've got a different case here. What I've got is this is a regression model that I built. And what it does is it predicts the number of bicycles rented in Cambridge, Massachusetts, depending on the weather. And so you can see that the input, in this case, it says double. And we've got three parameters. We've got the temperature, humidity, the wind speed. And if we predict, in this case, we only get one item. We get a predicted count, which is returned by the model. And it's saying that it predicts 177. If we change the, change the values, increase the temperature, and reduce the wind, run it again, you can see that we get a lot more. Um, 1400. I'll do one more and then show the code. And in this case, we've got um, a text classifier that classifies an email as either ham or spam. In this case, it's saying that this email from Egbert around about .fmp is ham. And the next example is pretty clearly spam. So if I run this with the script debugger, we'll just go into the script and see how it works. I've just um, got three scripts depending on the type. So I'm clearing the variables. So in this case, we set the, the model name to be the, the description of the model. That gives us something we can refer to. Then we use a configure machine learning script step. And in this case, the option is general. I'll just bring that forward. So you can see that we've got the input. In this case, actually, we've got the model container that operation is general because we're dealing with text. The name, just a description of our model. So we then, that loads the model. That's fine. We then use the compute model function, in this case, to Valid. So we basically got the model name. It's a text. And then the parameters. Basically, it's just one parameter in this case, which is text, and then the input text. And then what we're doing is we're then unloading the model, which again uses the configure machine learning model step. So that just frees up the memory. Um, now, the, in terms of freeing up memory um, by unloading the models, it's probably a good thing to do. If you're going to be running this on um, iPhones, uh, resource usage might be an issue. If you're dealing with multiple models, which um, you might, then uh, that might potentially be more of a, a concern. Some of the models are fairly large. Um, if I look at the models, in this case, you can see that sort of the food models, in this case, is 230 megabytes. Whereas some of the other ones, like the text classifier model in this case, is really quite small, uh, just 91K. So if I go back to this one, and I'll do the same thing again. At Actually, what we'll do is just and in this case, what we're doing is we configure the machine learning model again. You can see that this is the general is the parameter there. Again, the others are the same, but the description. Now, what I've got here are, in this case, 
we've got three input parameters. And in the case of a model like this, the parameters have to be passed in by the name. The name is very, very important that, in this case, the model is expecting those precise parameters, temperature, humidity, and wind speed. If it doesn't get those, it's just not going to work correctly. So what we're doing is we're passing them in. like this. So what I've done is I've set up the parameters um, in a portal. So we're computing the model, the model name. Then we've got our first parameter. And the, the, the parameters need to be in this kind of order. You've got the parameter name. And then you've got the value. And then we've got our second parameter, the name, and the value again, and the third the name. So it always has to be paired in that way, the name and then the value. So one of the key things is that if, basically, if you're downloading a model, you need to get those, you need to find the parameters, of what they are. So there's a couple of ways of doing that. You, um, the most common one, uh, what most people would do uh, as the most logical is just to use um, uh, sorry to you. Sorry, just go on blank for a second. Um, basically, use um, Xcode, and you basically can, you can examine those parameters in Xcode. Um, unfortunately, I'm running a uh, slightly older Mac OS here, so I don't have the current version of um, Xcode on it. However, what I've done is I've I've also built a um, built a tool that allows you to interrogate the parameters of Corel model, ML models. And if I choose bike estimates and open it and upload it, what that basically does is it reads the metadata out of the model. And then in this case, you can see that the model's got three inputs, temperature, humidity, wind speed, and the type is double. And then we've got the two outputs a target, and then the a probability. And OK. So we then use our compute model, and we get our result. And the result comes as a JSON string, as you said. So that all seems pretty straightforward. And I carry on. Let's take a second look at um, the hot dog model. So we'll predict, and it's going to come back, tell us it's 99.9% .9 certain it's a hot dog. That's great. If I now do that again, you'll notice in this case, I've chosen the food model. In this case, I'm going to use the same image with a different model. This is food 101. And you can see that in this case, the predictions come back, and it, um, it thinks that it's uh, baklava. And it's 83% certain it's baklava. And it only thinks there's about a 3.5% chance that it's a hot dog. So one of the really, really key things is that the models are very, very sensitive to the context in which you're using them. Um, it, that, that can't really be emphasized enough that it's, it's not just a matter of going somewhere, finding a model and downloading it and using it because it, it's not necessarily going to be accurate. And that confidence level isn't actually a true level of likelihood that the image is what it thinks it is. It's the model's level of certainty about it. And those are two really quite different things. So choosing, choosing a model to use is, is something that is quite, um, quite critical. And um, I could basically talk for hours on that topic. And many, many of the areas that you find that you, you get issues with um, 
where people talk about bias in models, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a problem with the model. It, it's down to a mismatch in the choice of the model and where the model is being applied. Ideally, what you want is a situation where you've got a similar frequency distribution of items between where the model is applied and when the model was built. And that's not always going to be the case. So that's where you get these risks of bias coming in. So in this case, this, this illustrates another minor problem that FileMakers provided us with that confidence lower limit um, function. And they said it include at least one. Now, if you look here, you can see it's produced quite a large number of possible um, options. And if you restrict that to saying you're 50% confident, you want only 50% confidence, what happens when, you, when your model returns something, like in this case, and it's only 14% um, confident? Or how do you deal with not receiving a result? Um, it's one of the key things is that we're used to we're used to software systems that are deterministic, where they're they're programmed to do something based on a um, based on a set of conditions that the developer has, has set, and we can we can build that and we can test that. Whereas in this case, we're dealing with something that's probabilistic that um, this this model was never coded to identify this image or a hot dog. It was trained to do that by feeding it a set of, of training data that it then um, basically tried to minimize statistical errors in doing that. So in a lot of cases, you're not able to say specifically, how did it make this prediction? And that is is an area of, of risk. Um, I don't want to sound really, really negative because I'm really, really positive about the whole thing, but the, these are things you need to think about while we're building systems using this kind of functionality, that it, it does add in a number of other dimensions where things can go wrong. Um, if we look at this, um, uh, MNIST is a set of images and they were originally done, started in the 1990s when the US Postal Service did a lot of work um, and hired some of the leading machine learning experts to try to do automated handwriting recognition. And so this data set is, is one of the classic ones that most people start on when they're le learning machine learning. So it does a classification. So in this case, you can see that it's 94% certain that this is a zero, and about 4% might be a six based on that image. That's really, really, that's great, that's good. However, if we feed it an image like this, that is very, very similar, and we predict on this, to a person, it's quite clear that's an eight, or at least it's pretty clear. Whereas you can see that the model thinks it's only about a 10% chance of being an eight. The most likelihood, likelihood is that it's a zero. And the reason it thinks it's a zero is because right here, we've got a zero sitting in the... So with an image, while, while a person is able to focus and see this is what the image is all about, a machine learning model can't really do that. It, it doesn't know what to focus on. So that's why where the confusion is coming from, that it's picking up on this. And there's, there's quite a famous example of, um, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people talking about uh, machine learning models for, um, in medicine for cancer detection. And it is, it, it's really quite powerful and the results are quite striking. However, they're, they're not generally generalizable that when a model is trained, it works in that hospital with their with their images, their machines, and their ways of working. If they take that model and try to apply it to a different hospital that's got different technology for looking at images, 
it's probably not going to work and um that's that's a problem it, it's not really a problem with ml per se it's a problem with how people apply it um and there, there's another very famous example with um with cancer detection where somebody came up with this model that was absolutely superb it was so uh, all the test data just incredibly accurate and then they tried it in real life and it was just shockingly bad and when they went back and looked into it in more detail what they discovered was that all the all the training images of the images that had cancers in them had rulers in the images to to measure the size of the cancers so what they basically built was a ruler detection system not a cancer detection system so it there's a lot there's a lot of areas where um it's um you need to be quite careful um and okay so th what we're doing is we're taking egbert's email again and i've taken a sentiment detection model and i'm going to try to predict that and what we're getting here is an error coming back with an error 872 so if i look at the model uh, um what we can see is actually that in this case the input is a dictionary type so most of the other models that work with filemaker filemaker is very limited in the type of models that it can work with the inputs have to be very very simple so with images that's not a problem it just accepts an image and it can work with it or not if we're dealing with uh, other types of models that are involved in text most text processing models don't actually accept a chunk of text as an input what they do is they take pre-processed vectors of text as input and filemaker can't give that to them to them so they don't work so if you're using a model trying a model you need to be very very careful about error capture and error 872 means that the model inputs are too complex for filemaker to deal with and we also have a similar type of issue on the outputs. So uh, I downloaded this from Apple, PoseNet. It's a model that tries to estimate human poses for a single person or multiple people. And if we predict, basically, it didn't give an error on the input, but it gave an error on the output. Basically, it didn't return us a valid JSON object. And in this case, if I load that, sorry, what was that called? PoseNet. That's fairly small, so. Okay, so you can see the inputs actually here. We're, we've got an image, we've got a fair bit of information about the image. But you can see that the outputs, uh, basically what we're getting, we're getting a number of arrays coming back that are, that are fairly complex. And again, FileMaker can't deal with that. FileMaker can only deal with returning sort of relatively simple data in, in that kind of form, that type of thing. So um, that's kind of the end of the first part of my presentation um, and to be honest I'm not certain I'm really gonna have enough time to to actually do the, the second part where I was going to look at um, sort of building a model um, it, in terms of acquiring models you can you can download models from 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 Apple there's um, there's a number of resources on github where you can download models if your if your clients have got fairly specific needs, um, you can have models built. There are firms that do it, um, 
And depending on the nature of the models, they can be sort of fairly, if you're looking at a fairly, fairly complex model to do um, extracting, uh, say, one of, one of the people I spoke to in my dissertation, um, they basically were doing, um, they were doing fashion and they were extracting data on, um, on images from concerts, um, what kind of fashions people were wearing um, to see what was, what was popular and, and so forth. And they were basically saying that you would be looking sort of 20 to 30,000 pounds to build a model like that. So it's, it's not cheap and they've got, fundamentally what they do is they basically buy models wherever they can um, so if there's pre-existing models um, that are provided as a web service by Amazon or Google or, or Clarify or firms like that, then it's considerably cheaper to just use those. Now, you wouldn't be able to use that with, they're not core ML models, and you would need to use those through different, different mechanisms, uh, basically through insert URL if you're doing it from FileMaker or, or building up uh, sort of an API middleware around it um, but the, the other thing is that with models like that there, there, there's a lot of questions about the, um, the the lifetime of a model how long is a model actually going to last um, and if you're looking at a model of say uh, car car models or fashion it actually might have a very very short life short lifespan um, but the people who are doing this in their case that's kind of pretty key to their business. And so they're deriving a competitive advantage from it. So yeah, for them to spend 30,000 pounds to build a model it, that might have a lifespan of four to six months, um, they've gone ahead and done it because that's, that's how they're um, staying ahead of their competitors. So there's, there's quite a range of things to think about. Um, so, um, the moment that kind of is about it. I think what I've, what I've tried to do is to show that with, with relatively simple models, that if you need to deploy them on an iPhone, or actually that is one thing actually thinking about it, that in terms of deploying models to iPhones, if you're dealing with a simple model, FileMaker Server makes a very nice way of dealing with the deployment issues. Um, there's, um, I mean, Apple's deployment tools for anything on iPhone are notoriously bad. So if you needed to deploy a model, it was relatively simple and FileMaker can do it to, you know, a few hundred uh, iPhones. That's one way you can do it by, by basically downloading from FileMaker server. Um, so anyway, I'll stop um, rambling on and um, hand back to Jewel. Thanks, Ian. That was a, a great talk. Um, I enjoyed that one more than the last time I saw it because it was different and it's obviously more polished and you've had a bit more practice and there's a lot more information in there. Um, so it was even more informative, so it was good. Uh, okay. And yes, I think uh, it'd be great if you could uh, come back another time and, uh, and take us through the second part. Are you going to be around for questions if people have got them? Uh, yeah. For a bit? Yeah. yeah okay, so, so we'll move that. Um, yeah, thank you. Really, thank you. And that was that's fascinating. Um, I get excited every time I see that stuff. <laughs> um, Gary, you look like you're thinking of saying something. I was. I was going to ask. I was going to ask him. Yeah, brilliant. Actually, I had brilliant a question demo. for Ian in a minute, but go ahead. All right. um, with the Core ML stuff, then, is it very different to the Amazon? So the advantage of the Core ML is the fact, certainly from a security point of view, it stays on the device. So it's only on that device, isn't it? So. Yes. I think that's the argument they're, they're pushing towards is the fact that security is all held on the device and it doesn't call out to the internet. Uh, that's true, yes. So yeah, what, how is it different? Um, what, what you may find is actually that a number of the, um, the models don't call them. Because in, in terms of building models, there, there's a number of different ways you can do it, um, different frameworks. Um, you've probably heard of some of them, things like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn. Those are probably amongst the most common. Um, and what Amazon has done is Amazon has basically built an amazing infrastructure. Actually, it's, it's quite surprising, actually, because TensorFlow is a Google project that they open sourced because Google felt that it was really 
you know, state-of-the-art technology, if they open sourced it, basically they were able to still control much of it. And they're, they've also prevented other people from kind of coming in and stealing that march. Amazon has built a lot of their stuff around TensorFlow, this Google technology. And so things like SageMaker are basically layers on top of TensorFlow to make it a lot easier. Apple's got a couple of tools. In Xcode, they've got a pretty basic kind of tool that you can build models. And the, the demo I did at .fmp where I built the models really was trying to demonstrate that what I did was I, I basically converted um, uh, FileMaker log files, the stats log, into a FileMaker database, then basically dumped it out, as C did some processing on it, then dumped it out as CSV. And I thought, actually, it'd be kind of cool to see if you could predict you know, when your FileMaker server was having or might have performance issues or what was expected performance based on a given number of users. And I thought that'd be really cool to kind of build as a model. However, what it ended up being was a really, really good example of how something that looked so simple at the beginning actually really, really hard to do. Um, because- I was say, if you did it, can I have it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that frankly, all the, all the, um, the what you were talking about logging before, the, the important variables aren't stored in the FileMaker stats log. The important variables right. are, how complex is your database? How many joins are in your database? So at a given time of mm -hmm. day, how many users are actually in the really complex database versus in the really simple database? All that kind of stuff. To build that up is actually really quite a major effort. Um, and FileMaker has done a really bad job of providing, providing the tools to analyze that kind of thing. Um, but um, it, it actually ended up being really, really good example because there's other things that say for example if you just you have to with a model you have to, to split it into training data and test data and apple's tool provides no way of doing that so you do it yourself but you've got no idea if you're doing it correctly whereas some of the other tools have invested a lot in building tools to allow you to split into test and training data in a way that is going to be really statistically valid um, rather than someone like me who is kind of mediocre on statistics and I've got no idea if I'm doing it right or not. There, and I've got no idea how to test if I'm doing it right. Um, so whereas somebody at Stanford who did their PhD in the topic who wrote some code to do it, odds are their approach I'll is... trust that, yeah. <laughs> i trust that yeah. more than mine. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Um, so... Yeah, I've Gone. I, I was gonna. I was just gonna ask you a quick question, which I think actually relates to something that Christian's put in there. It's nice to see you here, Christian. Thank you for coming, Christian Schmidt. Um, he says that monkey bread, uh, the monkey bread plugin can handle a few more uh, data types for input output. I was going to ask: Is is the you said that some of the uh, that FileMaker couldn't handle some of the returned output in one of your examples was that a, a failure of the understanding of the json the json is just too complex a file maker or is it something more fundamental than that it, it's not returned json in a format that it's not returned json basically okay. it's, returned, it's returned a data structure that that um file maker cannot interpret into json so the the other the other point actually just thinking about it is that this is sort of actually wound up being a bit of a hobby horse of mine through my dissertation. But I think that all the work that's gone on in simplifying the process of building machine learning models means that we're going to be seeing a lot of really bad machine learning models. <laughs> um, and the, the the best book I read on the topic actually was from a, um, well, unsurprisingly, it was uh, from a professor of quantitative finance who's... Um, Oh, sorry, it's getting kind of windy and it's just blown over a plant pot on our balcony. <laughs> um, um, and yeah, he, uh, anyway, sorry, I will, I'll stop babbling. <laughs> <laughs> no, we like the babble. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, anyway, I'll be around um, for any, any questions if people have uh, got them. 
okay well i think i think technically we've got to the virtual pub time <laughs> um, we have it's just really an excuse for going and getting a beer if you want to go and get one um so i think we've <laughs> we've technically reached the end of the meeting but now it's just open for chat and um gary will be here until he's bored i'll be here until i'm, I'm too tired or whatever um yeah i've poured and a the, beer already it, and i've already had food so i'm all right <laughs> well i haven't had food so i might nip off and get something in these 10 minutes but um yeah just everyone chat amongst themselves i think even when gary leaves the meeting or when i leave the meeting it'll still run on so if, if it will people want to stay yeah. that's fine so and thank you all for for presenting and for coming and attending the meeting and uh, it's, it's been very enjoyable from my point of view i hope it's been valuable for everyone who's come along to it yeah. pub time I, i'd agree <laughs> with that i'd agree with that yeah go get a drink um i'd say uh if it's anything like last time we did this we were talking to the early hours of the morning so um <laughs> which it was it was farm maker for four hours so it was amazing <laughs> um, but, actually Gary. Well, yeah Cl how much you drunk Clive? <laughs> 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 sorry Ian. where you go I that I, I, i'm just on one of the points in your um topic you were talking about T tls versions yes um and you said um and actually i'm pretty sure that Unfortunately, I don't have access to the email account where I sent the email and seized it, but I'm pretty sure we, on a FileMaker server, switched off everything except for TLS 1.3 because um, because it basically with TLS 1.2, it kept one of our clients, their penetration test testing and security testing kept flagging up TLS 1.2 as, um, as a major problem for them. So we, we basically switched everything off except for TLS 1.3. And I'm pretty sure that the FileMaker stuff carried on working. If it does, great. I've not tested to that level, but I'm getting asked the same question from a security that we're doing. We're doing sweeps of our stuff. And yeah. it's come up on our web systems that it's recommended to upgrade to TLS 1.3. And I've looked at all of the documentation out on Final FileMaker and there's no reference to it at all. It's yeah. all TLS 1.2. So. Yeah. Um, what we did find was that we were using, um, this is running on Windows on, uh, mm -hmm. it was in two instance, we're running on Windows and we'd got things scripted to go off and get um, certificates from Let's Encrypt. Yeah. And basically switching off, it temporarily broke PowerShell because PowerShell needed, I need to go in and reconfigure PowerShell so PowerShell would use TLS 1.3 because it was defaulting yeah. to 1.1, I think. I can't remember all the details. It was about a year ago. But I mean, it ended up working beautifully once we'd, once I'd fixed all the things I broke, but. Well, it's good, it, but yeah, but it's good to know. It's good to know it will function. That's the important thing. It's not a, It's not an internal coding thing around uh, FileMaker. It's the typical thing with FileMaker. They're probably saying, well, we've supported and tested up to that level. Yeah. That doesn't mean to say it won't work in other levels. It will go further than that, but they've not tested it. It was a classic thing with the OS version. It's like, well, it's not supported on that. It's like the, the VMware. Oh, we don't support VMware for years and years and years. I've been running it for years in VMware. So it will work. It just, it's not supported by them. And yeah. I think Cause, cause, now and the documentation. So. Christian's just posted a comment in the, in the chat there about uh, uh, one, TLS 1.3. He says, curl and open SSL. And Apple Secure Transport can all do TLS 1.3. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, so if, if it's the point, the documentation doesn't say it. So it's that that thing of you read the documentation and say, right, that's it. I'm going to follow the guidelines of what FileMaker tells me. Technically, what FileMaker is telling you is about three years old. So I believe, <laughs> I, I, I believe that uh, a, a lot more is significant upgrade in security documentation for FileMaker is on the verge of potentially coming. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're going to write what it actually does instead of what they think it does <laughs> okay I, 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 I believe what will be coming will be enough to support you having an informed conversation with it about how farmmaker manages security and policies and pen testing rather than us all having to uh to guess that would be nice that would be time. nice if i could yeah there's no way to that would be nice if it actually does do that so that would be quite useful so um, um, on that note, before we end up getting into 
sorry dialogue of, of people that don't want to repeat this i'm going to stop the recording because the recording's been running all day since it started pretty much so um what what can be said now can be happily said with no ramifications so i'm going to stop that now <laughs>